with this um, second session of the day and the final live session of the conference. Um, so for this session to cap us off from a really uh, wonderful series of talks, in my opinion, I have the great pleasure of introducing Paul Petrosky and Alexis Wellwood. So they're both interested in uh, what kinds of things linguistic meanings might actually be and also how those meanings are related to the concepts that we use them to express. Uh, so first we'll hear from Paul, who is a distinguished professor of philosophy and cognitive science at Rutgers University. Thanks um, very much. So uh, what I wanna do today is uh, talk about uh, a dogma that's uh, widely accepted in my field of semantics and philosophy of language, often to the point that it just goes uh, unstated anymore. Uh, and so what I'm gonna do is just bring it out onto the table again, um, and then suggest that there were never any good reasons um, for adopting it. Uh, and then in fact, once we start taking the cognitive foundations of meaning seriously as we should, uh, I think part of what we need to do moving forward is actually to jettison this dog dogma, which I think is gonna get in the way uh, of uh, uh, future uh, discussions of the sort we've been having in this wonderful conference. And so let me also just add my thanks to the organizers um, for making um, uh, a, a really just wonderful uh, online uh, conference experience. So here's the dogma. Um, I've got it up there uh, with lots of words and then I'll put it up there a couple of times so you can read for yourself. But it sort of starts with this kind of concessive tone like we all know there are lots of meaningful expressions, even for a single language like English, but let's not race in, in supposing that there are meanings, things, meanings that expressions have. After all, we know how to invent languages where symbols have extensions that correspond to sets of things without having meanings or intentions with an S or a T, however you want to spell it, or senses or anything like that that determine these. Let's be neutral at the outset. And now here comes uh, uh, what I'm going to describe as a Trojan horse. So when offering theories of meaning, let's grant that linguistic expressions have extensions, but not assume that expressions have meanings in any further sense. And then there's a thought, associated thought, to look, whatever expression meanings are, if there are any, they're gonna determine what, if anything, the expressions are true of. So if you set aside worries about gathering up what an expression like rabbit is true of into a set, you can have this thesis also in red. If an expression E has a meaning mu, then E has an extension that's determined by mu. And then we introduce the usual caveats and semantics. We're gonna allow for contexts, functions, and possibilities. So you've allowed that the extension of an expression might be a complicated thing. It might be a function from context to functions, from possibilities to sets of entities. And so it might be a very complicated extension thing. That's okay. But the thought is you're supposed to assume that expressions have properties like that, extensional properties, an open question whether they've got any further properties. And if they do, their further semantic properties are supposed to determine these extensions. And there's a kind of corollary this, uh, of this dogma that's uh, been quite explicit since the 1960s and is still rampant um, in semantics and philosophy of language and semantics, that psychological studies of the natural phenomenon of understanding are at best optional additions to core semantics. So you psycholinguists can go off and study how people understand stuff if you want to and add that to real semantics uh, if you come back with anything. But there's been this old suspicion that semanticists, the people who actually specify meanings, there might be nothing for them to do apart from specifying extensions because speakers of the same language may have very different psychologies. Or if you were David Lewis or Montague, maybe your English gets spoken by aliens who have alien psychologies. And so maybe all the commonality is out there at the level of extensions of terms, and there just isn't anything more for semanticists um, to specify. Uh, and so here's the, uh, that old suspicion put another way that, that the semantic commonalities across speakers may be exhausted by a shared environment and general constraints of rationality applied to communication. Maybe that's it uh, for uh, determining semantic properties. Um, right, and so again, the, the dogma is often put as this, let's not race and assume there's too much to meaning, but it's put in terms of let's assume there's at least extensions um, to meanings. And what I wanna say is we just gotta like reject this uh, a Trojan horse, that if you wanna describe languages and explain the natural phenomenon of linguistic understanding, we shouldn't be granting that expressions have extensions. That's the super tendentious controversial thesis. Perfectly fine to suppose that expressions have meanings. We just gotta figure out um, what they are, but we shouldn't assume that meanings um, determine extensions. 
And uh, we should remember that the early advocates of dogma were actually talking about ideal languages. So that's the moral of the talk. And what I'm gonna do is start by just uh, giving a kind of sketch of history of where the dogma came from, because I think the history uh, often gets lost and then people get introduced to semantics as though this just came from God, that meanings determined extensions. And that was like established back in the ancient times and we just inherit that. Uh, and so what I wanna do is like, you know, uh, uh, go back and, and talk about that a little bit. Um, there are analogous theses about concepts that we can talk about in the Q&A or for another day. So you might also think that while there are many contentful concepts, it's not obvious that there are contents that concepts have, but that whatever con conceptual contents are, they determine extensions. For purposes of this talk, you can assume, or in my view, pretend that um, human concepts have extensions, but then just don't assume that the meanings I'm talking about are concepts. Uh, and since um, uh, uh, people use the uh, uh, vocabulary differently, let me just uh, make it clear that I'm thinking of meanings, if there are any, as properties of linguistic expressions themselves. So they're not like um, things people mean by trying to use expressions in context. They're, I'm thinking of meanings, if there are any, as properties of linguistic expressions on a par with pronunciations. It's not obvious what they are. We've got to figure out what they are. But I take the phenomenon of homophony, structural and lexical, to provide an initial guide. So if you want to know what is, what's this guy uh, Petrosky talking about when he talks about his meanings, the best I can do, I think, as a starter is to tell you that a pronunciation like the English pronunciation, a sheriff drew a gun near a bank, um, is ambiguous, as we put it, in multiple ways. Uh, it can either be um, uh, like unholstered a pistol near a financial institution or artistically um, sketched uh, a pistol near the edge uh, of a river. And because um, Drew and Bank are lexically uh, ambiguous, you got four possible meanings there. And for each of those, there's a structural ambiguity. So it can either mean the sheriff drew a gun near a bank, that is drew a gun that happened to be near a bank. So they're drawing a picture of a revolver lying next to the edge of a river, or it could be um, uh, or the sheriff um, drew a gun while the sheriff and the drawing was going on um, near the bank. So we've got this phenomenon of, of uh, lexical and structural homophony. And that's the sort of thing I mean by meanings. There's eight of them just for the, a sheriff uh, drew a gun near, near a bank. And we can ask, what are they? And now in terms of the dogma, does each one determine uh, an extension. Okay, so there's the uh, dogma again, the opening gambit, let's be neutral uh, and not suppose that meet words have intentions or senses, but let's do suppose they have extensions. If words have any further semantic properties, meanings, they've got to determine the extensions. The extensions might be fancy uh, function things, um, but uh, uh, that's really what core semantics is about, characterize those properties uh, of uh, extensional properties of words and the psychology stuff as an optional addition. Short form meanings of such there be uh, determine extensions uh, and uh, we shouldn't uh, go in assuming that there are further semantic properties to specify. Okay, so where did this come from? Um, so this is a very fast and biased history. It'd be like a full talk or a book chapter to work through properly. But initially, when people talked about meanings and extensions, the issues were about ideal languages designed for science, math very much included, see Frege. Um, and then attempts to cash out Frege's talk of senses as empiricist verification procedures, that just like did not work out. See the history of um, logical uh, positivism. And that fed suspicions that were in place at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, that semantic notions are just too hermeneutic for use in science. Meaning is about like, how people are trying to convey stuff to other people. And that just determines people's intentions. And uh, that's just not stuff that's fit for science. And then Tarski in his great work shows us that for a certain kind of invented language where you stipulate extensional interpretation for the language, talk of truth is scientifically legit. And Tarski wanted to make talk of truth scientifically legit so he could like do model theory and talk about truth um, in mathematics. And he said, truth is scientifically legit, given what he called the semantic conception of truth. That was actually a new use of semantics in the 1930s. Like before that, people thought semantic just meant like, you know, the meanings of expressions. And Tarski introduced a technical notion of semantic for his very technical scientific purposes to characterize a notion of truth within the formal sciences that um, uh, would allow him to like you know, ask questions about the relation between provability uh, and truth. Um, John Burgess has a wonderful paper on this Tarski's torque, if you want to um, chase it down. After Tarski, along comes Quine, who's right, genuinely 
in, in general, quite suspicious of interpreting scientific notation via Fragian senses or intentions, things Quine called creatures of darkness. And the thought was if you interpreted your formalism in terms of intentions, you were gonna end up with unwanted analyticities, sentences that would count as theorems of your theory just because of how you chose to interpret your notation. And Quine fairly enough said, that's not fair. You don't get to like make truths out of just how you interpret your notation, especially not in science, so don't do that. But Quine was also a behaviorist who thought there were no real facts about what natural expressions mean. On his view, linguists, including Chomsky emerging in the 50s, they were at best regimenting ordinary humans of speech because it's all just Skinnerian um, junk uh, or an associationist engine uh, inside the head. On my reading the history, what happens then is in the 1960s, basically, other philosophers, in what you might call the Harvard Extension School, or all one way or another associated with the Harvard philosophy department, that followed Quine in trying to make natural language fit an externalist mold, extensionalist mold. So there's Quine, Nelson Goodman, Donald Davidson, David Lewis. I got Saul Kripke down off because I'm not, he's a complicated character in many ways, um, uh, and Hilary Putnam, right? All associated with the Harvard philosophy department, and they're trying in various ways to make natural language fit an extensionalist mold. And that kind of greases a slide from the slogan, ideal meanings determine extensions, fine if that's how you define your ideal meanings, to the hypothesis, if natural language expressions have meanings or semantics any, or any properties of any kind, they're gonna determine extensions. And I think that really was a slide. If you go back and read the original papers, classic papers from Davidson and Lewis, I think you can see the slide between um, hypothesis uh, and just terminological stipulation and you know a slide from are we just regimenting to offering a real hypothesis, but then it got picked up um, uh, in the uh, uh, 70s by lots of people, uh, including linguists. And I think it then just, just started looking like, well, look, if we're going to posit meanings, they're going to be these extension determining things. But if your goal is descriptive, you just want to describe the spoken or signed languages that humans regularly acquire, like why would you be insisting that human um, uh, linguistic expressions have, uh, have extensions? If you look at work going on even in the 60s, like down the street from Harvard at MIT, all the studies of meaning were still overtly mentalistic. So Chomsky's papers uh, in the early 60s, um, Katz and Fodor, uh, Katz and Postal, whatever you think of generative semantics, the assumption was still all theories of meaning, it's all about the mind. And it's perfectly continuous uh, with Braille from the 1890s and work from Husserl at the end of the 19th, early 20th century. Like, of course, the study of meaning uh, is one way or another about the mind. And it wasn't like there weren't skeptics uh, of the emerging truth conditional extensionalist program. Chomsky, Gil Harmon, John Foster, Jerry Fodor, Ray Jackendoff, or others believe like, hang on, where did all this extension stuff uh, come from? But again, on my reading the history, what happens is, is linguists start just um, uh, adopting it through like very, very uh, good early work by Barbara Cartier and others adopting it as a kind of starting model. It then becomes just like part of like, oh, we just assume this. And then you move to the 80s and people like Gareth Evans, uh, Chris Peacock, Martin Davies, Hans Kamp, Arena Heim, Jim Higginbotham, and then a little later, Larson Siegel, the people who start reminding us, oh, by the way, representations really do matter. They each in their own way still hang on to the dogma that expressions have extensions and say, we can add psychology to the um, uh, extensionalist um, framework. And there's lots of 21st century work picking up on that thread, right? Recent conferences, including this one, um, right, um, you know, work I've been involved with uh, uh, for a long time, thinking about quantifiers, in particular, how you um, uh, represent the meaning of proportional quantifiers, like most, is in terms of one-to-one -one correspondence or in terms of number to use negation uh, or, uh, or not. I, I don't want to talk about that here, right? Uh, uh, people are, are thinking familiar with this kind of work now that um, uh, where people have been digging in trying to say, oh, actually, there's kind of interesting commonalities across human speakers and how in terms of how they understand quantifiers. And so you don't have to suppose that all of the work um, is to be uh, on the side of characterizing uh, extensions. Um, there's some uh, 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 papers coming out uh, with a graduate student, Tyler Knowlton, as the uh, 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 lead person that Alexis and I have also uh, been involved with. Um, uh, I'm happy to like uh, send people stuff if they're interested. My point here is just that in recent um, uh, years, there's been a ton of stuff of people going back to the idea that, oh, right, the representations really do matter. 
And now at the semantics conferences, you don't get resistance to psycholinguistics the way you used to. And for the younger people, I assure you, um, it used to not be, yes, let's all get together um, and work um, together on this. It used to be, if you're doing psycholinguistics, you are not studying meaning. Now there's a more kind of open, yes, we can all do this together, so long as everybody just agrees that psychology is an addition to the idea that we're specifying meanings uh, extensionally. And uh, in a 2018 book, um, uh, Conjoining Meanings, uh, like one way of summarizing the idea of that book is it may be just be time to jettison uh, the extension dogma as a kind of odd and implausible uh, relic. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's there for historical reasons, but for historical reasons that had nothing to do with cognitive science. And it sort of came into semantics for its own historically quirky reasons. But in my view, there was never any reason to accept it and some very powerful reasons to reject it. And so what I want to do is just review some of those, I think, very powerful reasons for rejecting it so that we can think as we're thinking about the cognitive foundations of meaning, stop worrying about like, you know, uh, uh, whether we need to preserve the idea that meanings are extensions and tell our colleagues um, who were in for that, like, that's your idealization, uh, but it just um, uh, was never part uh, of a, uh, a, a serious picture uh, about human linguistic meaning. So the first problem I just want to remind people of and this was, this was like immediately um, noticed in the uh, early 70s. If you were specifying your extensions the way Donald Davidson did, so you wanted to say the sentence Hesperus is a planet, says you got some axioms that specify the extension of Hesperus and a planet, and some axioms that let you go from the extensions of words to the extensions of sentences, you could crank out theorems like Hesperus as a planet is true just in case there's something that meets the Hesperus condition and it meets the planet condition. Larson and Siegel's textbook is the best thing I know for actually working this out um, in detail so you can see how the derivations go. But what everybody knew uh, very quickly, or at least after John Foster's paper, was that you know since Hesperus is phosphorus, you can have the equally true axiom that something's true of Hesperus just in case it's identical to phosphorus. An object is an object that woodchuck is true of, assuming woodchuck has an extension, just in case that object is a groundhog. And instead of saying that is a is like, you know, it's not doing anything really at all, you say, well, let's just toss in a, a, a random mathematical theorem, you know, e to the i apply plus one equals zero. That's not going to change uh, the truth conditions. Uh, and so from equally true specifications of the alleged extensions, you could derive in perfectly fine um, truth preserving ways. Um, uh, uh, claims like, well, you know, Hesperus is a woodchuck. That sentence is true just in case there's something that's phosphorus and it's a groundhog and e to the i pi plus one equals zero, which does not seem like a great specification of what Hesperus is a woodchuck means. Um, and so the conclusion for many of us was, yes, representations matter for meaning and extensional equivalence is not semantic equivalence, not even provable extensional equivalence. And it didn't matter if you specify your um, meanings in Lewis Montague style as in the Hyman Crotzer textbook, which is now uh, standard. There's, if you like, the kind of legit uh, derivation you might hope for, for Hesperus uh, is a groundhog. Uh, and um, there's the one for, uh, uh, right, Hesperus is a groundhog, just in case um, the groundhog function applied to phosphorus uh, yields truth. Oh, and by the way, e to the i pi plus one is equal to zero, um, right? There's one paragraph in the Hyman Crotzer textbook that mentioned this. And they say, well, it's got to do with the difference between what theories say and what they show. And, you, and you're like, what? Um, uh, uh, can somebody tell me like, what, what that amounts to? Ray Olson and John McDowell just like blends in the Heim uh, and Kratzer a textbook. And then the problem is set aside, right? Um, I, know of no, I know of no good solution to this problem. <laughs> um, so uh, 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 that's one reason you might think this idea that you should assume that meanings have extensions and be skeptical about whether there's anything more. It's like, you got to be kidding, right? Um, uh, the specifications of truth conditions are not specifications of meaning. Something I think now people are like, well, yeah, of course, but that yeah, of course, right, um, uh, casts doubt on the dogma, right? Lots of discussion over the last um, uh, 15 years or so, picking up older threads from the 70s about polysemy and co-predication. So you've got sentences like, he dropped the book he defaced and plagiarized the book he wrote. The red book was too heavy to carry. The blue one was too hard to read. The book he stole was valuable. The book he reviewed was worthless, uh, even if it's in some sense the same book. Um, uh, so uh, common thought, the word book can be used to access a concept, mental representation, whatever you want to call it, 
uh, a subsense of books as vehicles for content versus uh, an alternative um, subsense or concept uh, for books as the contents that uh, get carried by vehicles. Um, uh, uh, a window can either be um, used to talk about the hole in the wall or the thing used to fill in the wall. And what's characteristic of these examples, um, garden variety cases of um, polysemy, is that what I would think of as the distinct concepts associated with the word that can be accessed on different occasions of use are in one sense as different as concepts can be. If you're thinking about what the concepts are concepts of, what they apply to, it's hard to imagine a bigger difference between the hole in the wall and the thing you buy from the Home Depot to fill up um, the hole in the wall. The content of the book that you can download is quite different than the vehicle uh, uh, that you can drop uh, on the table. Now, there's another sense in which um, for human cognition, these concepts go together. We find it very natural to think of vehicle and content as going together uh, and likewise hole and filler, especially when, when one of the concepts has a kind of functional um, aspect to it. There's gonna be a, another one that so to speak comes along uh, and is in the same field. But if you're thinking about things in terms of extensions, they're just wildly different um, concepts. The reason they go together is because of the kind of minds we have, not because of um, the way uh, the world is. Um, this is true, I think, um, with a vengeance, if we go back to thinking about the poverty of stimulus par excellence in Plato's Mino, uh, where you start thinking about geometric objects, and you realize that drawing lines in the sand can be the trigger to thinking about the lines that are relevant for thinking about geometric theorems. And it's a really quite striking thing that we find it perfectly natural to use the word line in English to talk about things that are perceptible, that you can draw on the board and see, and things that are completely abstract, have no width, and hence are in, in principle imperceptible. Again, in terms of like alleged extensions, it's hard to see how the extensions could be more different. Actual stuff built of chalk dust that's perceptible and has width, abstract objects that have no width and are completely imperceptible. The concepts, if you like, dovetail for minds like ours, and that's interesting. And so we use the word line in a way that lets us access dovetailing concepts. But the idea that the word line has an extension, like, whoa, like um, uh, it just seems like that just can't be right on its face. Um, and if you're thinking to yourself, well, maybe some kind of disjunction is gonna help, um, think in the case of book, if you've got a um, volume that's got two um, uh, Jane Austen novels in it, Sense and Sensibility, Pride and Prejudice, but it's just one volume, and somebody asks how many books there are, one good answer is one, another good answer is two, a terrible answer is three. Um, uh, and so it can't be that book just means either vehicle uh, or content, that's just not how we count books. We count books either by vehicles uh, or contents as if the word can be used on some occasions to access a vehicle concept and on other occasions to access a content concept. But if that's true, now question why on earth would you think the word book itself has an extension? And then of course there are um, uh, further uses of lines when you get to talk about lines and faces. So yeah, Aristotle made the point that being is said in many ways, right? That, the, that when you use the word being in English, Greek or English, there are various things you, the person might mean, but likewise for book, window, line, and I think pretty much every expression uh, of a natural language. Uh, and there's a couple of uh, references um, to some recent stuff that will get you up to speed on the phenomenon of polysemy, uh, including lots of interesting neurophysiological studies uh, if you're um, not uh, up to speed. Um, so look, I think there's just this very, very important distinction uh, uh, in natural language. And when we talk about meaning, we got to find some way of respecting this distinction between homophony on one side and polysemy on the other. So homophony, think of that as one pronunciation uh, shared by two more expressions, each of which has its own meaning. Bank is everybody's favorite go-to case for lexical homophony. But as I mentioned earlier, they can also have structural homophony. Polysemy, um, generally described as saying, no, it's a single expression, but whose meaning supports a family of concepts uh, or subsenses. You see this in uh, dictionaries uh, all over the place, lexicographers struggling to try to like, you know, figure out um, uh, 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 which subsenses are related to which. For my purposes here, the point is only however much homophony you want to posit, polysemy always seems to outrun it. And that's the reason I think you've got to have the distinction. So for a word like bank, 
once we disambiguate lexically between River Edge and the financial banks, you're still left with polysemy on the financial bank um, sense, because that can either refer to the institution, say Chase Manhattan, uh, which is this uh, right, uh, uh, awful uh, institution that does horrible things uh, to the economy, or a particular building that you could literally bump into or walk uh, into. Right, and uh, nobody um, thinks those are completely distinct um, lexical items uh, with their own uh, meanings. Right, homophony typically uh, arbitrary, uh, 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 where it, and linguistically accidental. Um, so uh, uh, words that are homophonous in English uh, are not necessarily going to be homophonous in French, whereas in French, so 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 are uh, homophones. But the English translations, uh, bucket, stamp, and jump, uh, I think, are um, uh, not uh, homophones. Whereas uh, polysemy, not arbitrary, often common across uh, languages. Um, not all languages that have a verb hold have all of the subsenses you get in hold, but you get a bunch of them. Um, and uh, uh, as shown with the co-predication cases, uh, polysemy tends to support anaphora of the sort. The windows that we cut in the walls were nicer than the ones we installed. So there's ones, the pronoun one referring back tied to window, but the first use of window, you're using it to talk about um, the holds. Uh, now in this, on the use of one that's anaphorically dependent, you're talking about the thing you bought from the hardware store to fill up the hole, right? That's a classic co-predication case. Polysemy supports that kind of uh, anaphor and uh, uh, co-predication, where it's just a bad joke to say the banks of the river were nicer than the ones we robbed, right? I think there are just tons of facts that suggests you've got to have a distinction somewhere in your theory between homophony and polysemy. If there is such a distinction, right, that's an obvious difficulty for the idea that lexical items themselves have extensions, because then you've got to specify extensions for polysemous ex expressions. So I think it's no accident that um, uh, no standard semantic textbook I know has a chapter on polysemy. Um, and that's because the standard textbooks are built to tell you that meanings determine extensions. What you need to do is idealize away from polysemy uh, in order um, to keep that idealization alive. Um, if you think about polysemy and homophony from a child's perspective, I think that, that there is such a phenomenon as not surprising at all. So if you think about lexical acquisition, um, kids are pretty good at guessing which concept speakers are expressing on particular contexts and then confirming, revising their initial gu guesses. Go see um, Gleitman and Truswell on uh, confirm, guess, confirm, verify. But if you imagine kids adopting a one word, one concept, and then one concept, one extension policy, it would be nightmarishly hard for a child to decide when a new utterance of a word is an utterance of an old word. If the ground rules were different extensions, different meanings, so different words, then the child would have to be in the business of not just figuring out which concept uh, uh, people were using, they'd have to be trying to figure out, well, what are the extensions uh, of these uh, expressions? And then you might think if the child could do it at all, homophony would just end up being way more rampant than it is, right? The child would have to conclude, for example, having heard bank to use to talk about buildings, then when they encounter the expression Chase Manhattan Bank as say as an adolescent, they're gonna to have to add another word uh, to their um, uh, lexicon. Whereas I think polysemy looks much more just like a result of kids treating homophony as a last resort strategy, right? The child had better be in the business of not assuming new utterance of a word is an utterance of a new word. That way lies a lexicon that never ends. Um, and so the kid I think has to assume let me try to accommodate this new use as a use of an old word if I can and go for homophony only as a last resort. But if that's the case, then cases like book um, uh, and window, and there's evidence from uh, Jesse Snedeker's lab at Harvard and other places suggesting that kids are on this uh, immediately. Um, if the kids can initially associate lexical items with dovetailing concepts that have distinct extensions, well, then they're set up from a very early age to tolerate um, polysemous items. And then as adults use words in various ways, presumably kids just say, okay, fine. Uh, there's yet another use of a uh, line. And that surely is gonna frustrate the idea that the word line the kid ends up acquiring and keeps accommodating new and new uses um, itself uh, has an extension. So the representational system surely matters. And we wanna understand why it is the kids um, uh, polysemize and homophonize as they do, but extensions, right? It just seems like that's just gonna get in the way 
uh, of trying to understand the interesting cognitive phenomena, if we suppose that every word a child acquires has to have an extension. What we are told in the standard semantics textbooks is that proper nouns, at least, are not going to be conceptually equivocal uh, because they're just labels for things out there, which later on in the semantics class you're told is just, of course, not true. Um, uh, and so in thinking that meanings determine extensions, it's really important to not suppose, yes, but surely it's right for proper nouns. Because um, uh, prima facie, proper nouns are a lot like common nouns, as Tyler Burge told us in the 70s. Uh, you say things like there were three Napoleons at the party, two were wearing hats, the third one sang, the Napoleon who sang is a good cook, our Napoleon would never do such a thing, the little Napoleon on the committee uh, must be stopped, as if even the proper noun Napoleon can over time get associated with various senses or concepts and not have a common extension. Right? In languages like English, we do have uses where you just use Napoleon bare up front, Napoleon lost at Waterloo, but go check languages like Greek and you'd find out that that's out. You got to throw a little marker up in front of the Napoleon. Oh, Napoleon uh, lost uh, at Waterloo. And so pretty standard these days to say that proper nouns have a determiner phrase structure and there's a covert uh, determiner uh, uh, in there even in English. And that the proper noun Napoleon is just as polysemous as common nouns, right? There's no need to be positing homophony and lexical entry for every single Napoleon uh, you know, as opposed to just saying Napoleon is a predicate that can be used to access various concepts on various occasions of use, including concepts of like, you know, the famous sense states of, you know, like a, a, a person who's uh, like uh, acting like a dictator uh, and needing uh, to be stopped. Especially if you're a philosopher who's read Hillary Putnam's The Meaning of Meaning paper, then the thought is yes, but surely kind terms uh, have extensions like rabbit, dog, and water, that somehow those words are just magnetically drawn to um, properties uh, uh, in the world, and that's why they have the extensions uh, they do. It's rarely mentioned that that idea is in tension with one of the motivations for the dogma. The dogma gets motivated initially, like surely everybody's like wildly different conceptually. Alexis has her concept of rabbits. I have mine. Rachel has hers. And here we are with our wildly different concepts to rabbits. And the only thing we've got in common is the extension. When push comes to shove for the extension list, they say, actually, Alexis, Rachel, and I all have the same concept of rabbit. It's a kind concept. Uh, and it latches on to something uh, in the world. Right? But if you actually just think about the world, you realize there's a lot of stuff out there and if you actually think about this case rabbit, which is the go-to case for extensionalists, um, uh, if you grew up in Europe or the Eastern portion of the United States, it's almost certain that your paradigmatic rabbits were what's called the European rabbit. There's one species of it, but boy, is it um, uh, prolific. But um, if you uh, grew up in the uh, 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 Rocky Mountain area of the uh, United States, uh, your go-to uh, paradigm rabbits are cottontails. Uh, and there's 17 um, species of them. And if you start searching around the world, right, taxonomists actually have a very hard time figuring out exactly what to count as rabbits versus hares uh, and jackrabbits. And if you think about a child growing up in, let's say, um, uh, East Coast United States, they could have various kinds of kind concepts, but the one kind concept they're surely not going to have is a concept of cottontail rabbits because they never encountered them. Whereas, right, I see cottontail rabbits uh, on a quite uh, a regular basis. I can use the word rabbit to talk about all these things, but the idea that there's a kind property out there, rabbit, and that for every speaker of English, their word rabbit has been drawn to that kind concept, I think just, just doesn't like jibe with what one just knows about the rabbits, right? Uh, it, I mean, there's a kind of tendency for externalists, I think, to have a priori views about how the world is organized in order that um, uh, uh, it should support uh, the externalism. And this is, of course, not just about um, uh, rabbits, right? So um, it's also true, uh, sorry, uh, uh, let me just mention, right? Psychologists like Frank Kyle, uh, Susan Gelman, when they're talking about um, kids having concepts in the, con in, in the sense of tending to essentialize, that I think is almost certainly right. Lots of evidence in that direction. But of course, as right, uh, Kyle and Gelman would go stressed, that does not get you to the idea that the child's concept fixes on an uh, extension uh, uh, for rabbits. 
And it's not just rabbits, right? Uh, uh, the word dog, right? It's not at all obvious that, that corresponds to anything like a language independent kind. The distinction between domestic dogs, gray wolves, and coyotes um, is very, very hard, uh, hard to nail down. Um, water has become uh, the case par uh, excellence. Uh, and so I just report here some facts again about water. Um, club soda, uh, diet, uh, Coke, uh, and tea uh, all have H2O contents uh, above 99.5. I have a well uh, in uh, Northern uh, New Mexico. And when I got the report for the well, the person who gave me the water analysis for the well says, well, there's good news and bad news. The good news is you don't have uranium and arsenic. The bad news is you have everything else. But that's absolutely typical for well water in that part of the country. And the H2O content is about 99.4, uh, so less than the H2O content of Diet Coke. So again, the idea that there is just this stuff out there, H2O plus or minus impurities, and that the word water latches onto it, right? This is just not independently plausible. It's pretty much what externalists have to say, but that's a very different thing. Um, and if one goes back and reads um, Putnam's famous The Meaning of Meaning paper, what you find is in the early part of the paper, he takes it as a premise that meanings determine extensions, and then he goes on to talk about water. So if you're thinking that there was an argument in that paper, somehow from the alleged twin earth intuitions to the conclusion that meanings determine extensions, it just ain't true. The premise takes it as a, the paper takes it as a premise that meanings determine extensions, and then when you just consider the facts about the things that um, uh, humans will uh, uh, call water, there's an old paper by Barbara Malt about this and then recent um, uh, work, uh, 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 recent work um, uh, that I can also point you to if you're uh, interested. So showing that, look, it, unsurprisingly, people are perfectly willing to call the stuff on Putnam's Twin Earth um, uh, water. Uh, and that's, uh, they're perfectly willing to call the stuff that comes out of my well um, uh, water. So in fact, in the go-to cases that are, were supposed to at least sort of motivate the idea that meanings determine extensions, proper names and so-called kind terms, I think when you look into what were supposed to be the very best cases for the idea that meanings determine extensions, they turn out to be arguments that meanings don't determine extensions. Um, and I think that's telling. If you look at the best possible cases for the view and they turn out to be arguments against the view, you gotta start wondering um, what was motivating the view to begin with. If you think as a linguist does about nouns like um, rabbit and tofu as having structure, then I think you can also see that we're gonna be forced to say that what are often called the mass nouns or root nouns without a kind of count feature we're gonna to have to say that those are conceptually equivocal too. Maybe we can specify the content of a mass concept of rabbit in terms of a primitive count concept that applies to the things that hop by, either cottontails or European rabbits. And then you appeal to something like David Lewis's universal grinder. Um, right, this idea goes back to you know, Russell, Helen Cartwright, um, Jeff Peltier, and other people have, have discussed it. But this thought that somehow the count concept is the primitive one, and you get the mass concept by somehow talking about the stuff from one or more things uh, that count as countable rabbits. I think that might be right at the level of some concepts. Likewise, maybe we can get at the content of a certain count concept of tofus in terms of a primitive mass concept that applies to samples of tofu on the plate, and then some kind of unitizer that lets you think about countable units. So I want like Smith's tofu as opposed to Jones, Jones's uh, better tofu. So I don't want to deny that at the level of concepts, you can sometimes start with a count concept and mass size, and sometimes start with a mass concept and count size. But think about now from the point of view of a linguist, the primitive expression root rabbit and root tofu, either of which can be combined with a count concept. Presumably those root expressions have to have meanings of the same type. They're expressions of the same ilk. And moreover, the language does not know what the rabbits are and the tofus are, right? And so unsurprisingly, the language leaves room for errors about how the world is. A child might encounter rabbit 
fish chicken on a plate and think it grows out of the ground. Or somebody might think that tofu on the plate actually comes from free range tofus and this has all just been like a ploy to fool the vegetarians, right? The language does not know that rabbit comes from rabbits and tofu is textured protein. The language just knows you've got root nouns, rabbit and tofu. When a child acquires the word rabbit, they may acquire it in a count context and use a count concept. And when a child acquires tofu, they may acquire it in a mass context and use a mass concept. But there's nothing about the grammar that requires that. And so I think even for rabbit and tofu, you got to say, well, look, um, it's not as though the meaning of rabbit knows that it's stuff that comes from rabbits. And it's not as though the meaning of tofu knows that it comes from stuff that comes eventually from just from up out of the ground, right? Um, this is all just real world knowledge. Uh, and so, in fact, I think I can use the root noun rabbit to say of Alexis, now, poor Alexis, um, she thinks that um, uh, rabbit is textured um, soybean, uh, right? And poor Rachel um, uh, thinks that um, tofu uh, comes from uh, tofu is the walk. I can use my word rabbit to get an atomic mass concept to talk about Alexis' mental state. And I can use my word to tofu to get a an atomic uh, count concept in an attempt to, to describe Rachel's state. So again, I just think we just got to like get off the idea that the language is there knowing how the world um, works in order um, to give us uh, meanings. And even if we temporarily waive concerns about whether count nouns have extensions, we really do have to ask what's the general story for the root nouns without the count feature? Because whatever you think about the universal grinder story for words like rabbit, try it for anxiety, business, color, democracy, energy, fate, weather, wisdom, wit. And now think again about the extension dogma that meanings determine extensions, right? Uh, you know, I, I, I sometimes used to feel like, you know, John McEnroe, right, about to have a, a, a kind of meltdown with my colleagues, right? Can anybody really seriously at this point think that the English word space has an extension that we're just going to specify as lambda x, x, space of x? Um, uh, but now to bring this like a little closer to home so we're not just laughing at others. When we talking about the cognitive foundations of meaning use words like concept, conception, meaning, meanings, language, and languages, we have to remember these words are massively polysemous. The language does not settle for us what we're talking about. So if we use a word like concept, or a word like meaning in offering our theoretical proposals, we really have to be clear about saying, and now let me tell you by introducing a technical term, what I'm trying to say. If I just use these words as an ordinary English speaker, I can't assume that the words themselves have set the topic uh, of my discussion. This is life with a language where your words are polysemous and conceptually equivocal. You got to say what you mean uh, even after you've um, used the words. Um, let me wrap up by just saying that I don't think that accommodating conceptual equivocality is that hard. Um, uh, it does require moving away from the standard textbooks, but uh, I don't think it's especially um, difficult. So instead of assuming that our theory of meaning should specify extensions for complex expressions, let's just allow for theories that specify how complex expressions can be used to build concepts from polysemous constituents. So a standard um, analysis of saw linguist open a window would be saying, all right, open a window, that's got to be a phrase true of events of opening, because open has to have an extension. And it's an event in which the thing opened is in the extension of window. So you got to have an extension for window that somehow presumably like does the stuff deals with holes and fillers. And then likewise, um, you got to like have an extension for linguist and like ordinary people when they use the word linguist do not mean like, you know, uh, people like Alexis, Rachel and me who study languages, but don't know that many of them. They mean people who know lots of languages uh, and who uh, uh, don't study them. Um, uh, uh, right, so your language, be a linguist, you gotta like know 10 languages, right? Yeah, uh, right. Uh, the standard theories are gonna say linguist has to have an extension and um, uh, uh, the, this phrase saw linguist open a window is gonna be true of processes 
that get done by something in the extension of linguists and they terminate with events that end in the extension of open a window. That's the kind of standard view, but it's not that hard to get off of that and say, look, let's stop thinking that window open and linguist have extensions and just say the word, ling the word window says, pick a concept from the window family. The word open says, pick a concept from the open family. And now you take the phrase open window, open window as an instruction to build a concept of the form that's just the form described in the standard semantics textbooks. You just say, you're not specifying an extension. You're just saying the job is to build a concept that has that shape, um, something that's an opening of a window. Were you talking about opening up the hole, whatever that means, or opening up the filler, whatever that means? I don't know, look into the context and figure it out. The language isn't gonna settle that for you. But in terms of the combinatorics, it's just not that difficult to allow the lexical items to effectively say, choose from certain concept families and think of the phrasal, the phrases saying, and here's how you build up uh, the thing. So, you know, you know you're, you're putting a piece of Ikea furniture and it says like, choose one of the things from number three and one of the things from number four and hope they fit together, right? That, the, that's the picture. Uh, and then likewise um, up the tree. Um, and uh, uh, so the extension dogma is not the uh, uh, only um, game in town here. This 2018 book uh, I wrote, Conjoining Meanings, is basically at the end of the book an exercise in just showing how you do this. Um, and I think it's just not that hard a thing. You can reconstruct the first semantics class in these terms. So there isn't an argument of the form, this is the only um, uh, uh, game in town. Uh, uh, the other game may be wrong, but you can't, I think, just argue for the standard picture uh, by saying there simply is no other alternative on the table. And then the other facts I've been walking you through, I think, just suggest, yeah, we just got to be looking elsewhere uh, for thinking about what meanings are and uh, emphasize the mental representations and uh, get off of the uh, extensions. So I think I've hit 45 minutes, so I'm going to um, stop. So there's plenty of time um, for questions. Um, but so there's the short form, uh, the dogma again, and I think it's a Trojan horse. I think it's a slight, somebody says, here, let, we're, we're just trying to be neutral about what meanings are. Please take this idea on. But I don't think there's anything neutral about it at all. Uh, it's basically a way of saying meaning is fundamentally about how words are related to the world and fundamentally not about how words are related to the rest of the mind. And I just think that's something we've got to get past uh, uh, moving forward, especially if we're going to discuss uh, cognitive foundations of uh, meanings. If you prefer Monty Python to Homer, uh, as your source of metaphors, um, replace Trojan horse with Trojan uh, rabbit. Um, I think we can and should deny that human linguistic expressions uh, have extensions and just really focus on the mental representations. Thanks, and thanks again to the organizers for providing such a delightful uh, online uh, environment for context. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. So we have some time for questions. I'm gonna go a little bit out of order and we'll take the first question from Emily. Hi, um, thank you for that great talk. Um, partly as I find it fascinating, I've been thinking in a similar way um, uh, with the relationship between polysemy and um, acquisition and stuff. And I've, I'm wondering if this would jive with how you're um, seeing things. Can the extension of something not just be much bigger and relativized to the speaker that is like the person who has completed the acquisition process? Yeah, good, good. So, so I was thinking about meanings as fundamentally properties of expressions. But if what we want to say is for purposes of talking about how languages as generative procedures get used in communication, then of course, what we're going to need to say is, well, look, Paul, you just talked about these instructions that said, like, go reach for something from, let's say, the window bin or the book bin and come out with something in a context um, uh, like, you know, reasonable speakers will be using all sorts of information in the context to guide their choice. And I think, in fact, that's where uh, a lot of interesting work about how languages as generative procedures get used in communication is gonna be. What I don't think is that the word itself comes with like a little index that says, oh, and in context one, pick the whole, in context two, pick the filler. 
And in part, I think that because I think polysemy is an open-ended phenomena. I think as you, as you age, you keep acquiring concepts in your line bin. And so I just don't think there are enough indices to go around. Mm -hmm. um, but I certainly think that if I'm remotely on the right track about what meanings are, what it means is we've now got to think carefully about the use of meanings in contexts to express concepts. And I just think that's going to be like interesting stuff that's going to involve uh, people telling me stuff about the mind that uh, a linguist is not trained to know. Our next question is from Matthew. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, so I'm glad that you presented this talk. Uh, I'm a philosopher, but I'm not inclined to believe in the extension theory. Um, I wanted to know what you thought about extensions for natural for uh, natural numbers and counting more. And you had given the example that it seems pretty natural to consider counting terms as having extensions, you, or you might, um, yeah. but you don't, wouldn't want to say that. So I'd like you to clarify. Okay, good, good, good. So um, here, I, here I would like especially want to be drawing distinctions between the words and the concepts. So I certainly believe that Frege had a concept of natural numbers that had an extension. And I think um, he taught me to how, to how to have that concept. So, and I, and I think that we have it as an aspiration that in the sciences and especially the formal sciences, we will come to have concepts that have extensions. When I think about the English word number, that word seems to me polysemous uh, as lots of others. Um, and uh, right and now, super interesting questions to be asked about what mental representations does a child associate with the English word number if they're acquiring English in what order? Um, which of those uh, uh, concepts uh, uh, have uh, extensions and which um, don't? Uh, and about that, um, I have views, uh, but uh, uh, for these purposes, I would be entirely like willing to be completely open um, and right, uh, right. I've, uh, together with uh, 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 colleagues with whom I do experimental work, we've been involved in a uh, project for a long time with um, Susan Terry um, and lots of other people, right? Trying to chase down, uh, among other things, uh, what kinds of representations uh, 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 kids do associate with number words and quantity words more generally. Uh, but that it's like, it's just an entire, I think, field, um, uh, 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 sub branch of cognitive science unto itself. But I would totally agree some of our concepts of numbers are concepts that have extensions. I just don't think the word has an extension. I mean, it, it, to first approximation, you can, get, you can get the view I'm aiming for if you just say, oh, what he thinks is that quite generally the relation between uh, words and concepts is one to many. Um, and so that even if the concepts have extensions, the words, the words ain't gonna, because you can't just, just, you can't just disjoin. Um, and uh, if you could just disjoin, it would be easy. But that's the point about the like one volume, two books in it kind of point that we don't just like think the extension of, word, of the word book is, well, anything that's either um, a uh, content uh, or a vehicle. We do, we do the counting and the individuating uh, one concept uh, at a time. Uh, and the words, I think, are just kind of pointers out to um, a space of concepts. Uh, but even if everything in the space had an extension, which I doubt, um, the word isn't going to have one. We'll take the next question from Susan. We can't see you or hear yeah. you, Susan. Oh, sorry. Let me just turn my video on. That was a great talk, Paul. I mean, really Thanks, wonderful. Um, so in a way, the... I just want to hear a little more about the relation between concepts and extensions. Yeah. Right. So, so I mean, obviously there are concepts that we can have that don't have extensions like unicorn, but, but except for cases like that, um, yeah. do, are, do, do all con concepts 
have extensions on your view? Yeah, so certainly not, certainly not all. Um, and now the question is, are the ones that don't marginal uh, or do the th things cut deep? So like, I don't think, I don't think my, the, I don't think the concept, at least not the one I build fast of um, set that contains itself or set that doesn't contain itself, <laughs> right? So there's those we got to set aside. Now we just think about blue and red, they're issues of vagueness. And so we'd have to say, now are we willing to have a notion of extension that can somehow tolerate vagueness? Um, but if we set paradox and vagueness, well, if we set the, the, the semantic paradoxes mm -hmm. and vagueness aside, however one does that exactly, mm -hmm. now we come down to the question that Mark Sainsbury, I think, is, he has this nice metaphor for it. Should we think of concepts as things that set up boundaries at all? Um, and um, uh, you know, about that, uh, uh, I found myself almost annually going back and forth. <laughs> so I, I just don't have a firm view about that. I can certainly see the pressure to say yes. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and, I, and, and as a working cognitive scientist, I would like to be able to hang on to that idealization mm -hmm. that um, modulo the semantic paradoxes and vaguenesses, vagueness, a particular concept, if we mean by concept, a mental symbol with which you can think about things in certain ways, yeah, it, it's and its extension is the things you can think about <laughs> in those ways. Right. Yeah, and 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 partly that's why I want to draw such a sharp distinction between meanings and concepts because right. I haven't seen my way clear to release myself from something like the extension dogma for concepts because maybe it's right. Yeah. Um, but it seems to me so wrong for meanings. I think what we cool. better do is not distinct. We better not identify meanings with concepts. So that's the time we have, Balan. Please hold your question for the end. For now, I'll take the opportunity to introduce our second speaker, Alexis Wellwood, who directs the Meaning Lab at the University of Southern California. Ah, you're still muted. Whoops, I'm too young for that. Okay. Um, so. Before I start, I wanna take my privilege as the, the last speaker um, to ask all of you to join me in really giving a round of applause to the organizers of this conference, especially Rachel uh, and Isabel, um, really from the selection of the talks to the organization of the schedule and just really pulling it off and keeping it seamless in this digital format. Hats off to you, Rachel Bravo. I mean, um, I, I wanna say that this has been one of the most exciting conferences I've ever been at. Um, uh, there's really just too many interesting connections that I've been able to make between issues that I'm interested in um, and the things that y'all y'all have been talking about. Um, I, at the beginning, I was taking notes so that in my talk, I could draw out some of those connections for you, but there's just like really way too many. Um, so I should also maybe spend some time telling you guys what I'm interested in. Um, uh, so hopefully you'll see some of those connections and you can um, bring them up in the Q&A. Um, uh, and I should mention my slides are available in my channel on Slack if you want a copy of the slides. Okay, so um, the big question that I'm really interested in that I'm not gonna answer today is uh, what is compositional meaning? Um, so I wanna give you a sense before diving into the, the kind of case study I'm gonna talk about of like where I locate myself um, and what type of approach I'm taking to this question um, and why I think it's a particularly fruitful one. And then we'll just sort of play out uh, the consequences as I see them. Um, so um, I'm going to start happily following Paul. I don't need to start where I usually start, which is like explaining to the philosophers why it's okay and interesting to do the kind of work I'm doing. Um, Paul sort of already covered that really well. Um, so I'll just sort of start here uncontroversially for this crowd. Um, uh, the idea that sentences express thoughts is a pretty reasonable one. Um, whether a sentence expresses a determinate thought, well, that's going to depend on uh, how the issues with polysemy resolve, as Paul talks about. Um, but sentences express thoughts. Thoughts we can think of as complex concepts. If we're lucky, depending on how the questions of concepts having extensions plays out, um, we might think that they are the kind of complex concept which are truth valuable. Um, but so this seems uh, reasonable and controversial. Uh, a different way of thinking about what the question of compositional meaning is, is the question, how do the rules and representations that compose sentences relate to those that compose thoughts? Um, so here's me 
at the interface between uh, linguistic cognition and non-linguistic cognition. And I'm drawing on the resources of compositional formal semantics as a way of spelling out uh, the interface between these two uh, uh, systems of rules and representations. Um, so the interface approach, which I take to be my job, is to specify how the linguistic units uncovered by morphological and syntactic analysis, so the minimal units like morphemes, uh, composites of those morphemes, phrases, um, sentences, if that's a special kind of syntactic object, um, how those sorts of linguistic units uncovered by morphologists and syntacticians relate to extra linguistic units. So um, primitive concepts, if we have those, uh, complex concepts, thoughts, uh, et cetera. So the kinds of objects that are uncovered by cognitive psychology. Um, so the perks of this job, at least as um, I've uh, explored it so far in my short career um, is that um, I think of semantic description as I know it, this formal compositional semantic description as really incorporating key aspects of um, not only linguistic description, so sort of the structural aspects of linguistic representations, um, but also um, features of the psychological or non-linguistic, uh, non-psychological, non-linguistic psychological description. And I think in that respect, it can um, help to guide inquiry on both sides. And like, this isn't uh, not an idea that's completely novel to me. It's implicit in a lot of work that you see, um, certainly in cognitive psychology. Um, so here's gonna be um, my starting point, just get kind of some of the assumptions on the table so you can see kind of where I'm located in the vast intellectual space that we're all kind of hanging out in. Um, uh, my starting point is to make a, a distinction, as is often done in linguistics, between two types of meanings, um, lexical meanings and functional meanings. Um, and the first kind of assumption that I've got in the background is that, um, you know, it's common enough to see um, when you take this kind of internalistic psychological approach to meaning to think that, um, you know, if you ask like, what's the meaning of a word, you might just identify that meaning with the concept expressed by the word. So I'm thinking much more in the vein of what Paul was talking about, where we don't want to make that identification, but rather we want to think about a lexical meaning as a kind of device for pointing to or fetching a concept from conceptual space. Lots of details for specialists there, not gonna get into them. Um, and what I, uh, the idea I'm trying to develop here um, for functional meanings is that they relate to class level features or operations. So that makes sense if you have a certain background view of this conceptual space where independently of language, concepts come in classes with often proprietary features and operations. So assuming something like core knowledge um, and related approaches, um, you know, we have a system for representing objects and we can perform operations on objects, like track them and things like that. We have a system for representing uh, substances and then there are proprietary operations that we can perform on those types of representations. So I'm imagining a mind roughly like that. Um, and so then in that kind of world, we might think that functional morphosyntax invokes abstract features of classes like measure, for example, or count, things like that, um, as well as shifts between uh, classes of concepts. So I don't take myself to be saying very much there, but it took me a long time to figure out how to say it. Um, so hopefully that gets your juices flowing as we talk about um, my particular case study. Okay, so here's the plan for the talk. In the first part, I'm gonna talk about the, uh, the syntax and semantics of comparatives. And what I wanna highlight there is that the dimension for interpretation that you get with a comparative sentence with a word like more um, depends on really quite subtle syntactic and conceptual commitments that come along with the choice of lexical item and the particular functional morphosyntax that's hanging around. Um, so what you can really see comparatives as doing then is really revealing class level uh, conceptual features and shifts, right? So if you wanna state the meaning of more, for example, um, you're gonna, you know, in the fullness of the, you know, how, it, how it's understood, you're really gonna wanna make reference to these classes um, and uh, aspects of, of different classes of concepts. Um, so then in the second part, I'm gonna show you some experiments that are designed to um, illustrate the fruitfulness of thinking about this uh, type of semantic theory as, uh, establishing a kind of tight bi-directional relationship between linguistic and non-linguistic cognition. So in the first two experiments, um, I'll show you what I, I take to be a really interesting kind of case where basically I posit in the first part that speakers, when they understand certain classes of sentences, um, represent covert quiet syntax of stuff that you don't hear, um, but they represent it and, um, and they choose uh, the dimension for interpretation of more uh, appropriately. So I'll show you experiments testing that. Um, and then in the last experiment, um, I'll show you the influence in the other direction. So basically, if we can give people a kind of experience that triggers a certain class, a certain class of representations, 
they should choose their syntax and their dimensionality appropriately. Um, so uh, yeah, let's dive right into it. Um, so in talking about the semantics of comparatives, I'm, I'm plugging my book, The Meaning of More. Mostly it's just the syntax and semantics. So the kind of stuff I'm talking about today um, isn't in there, but um, it's a fairly accessible introduction to the topic if you're uh, interested to unpack this current section. Um, I did wanna say here though, um, even though I said, look, I wrote the book on it, um, much of the things I'm saying here are contentious and could be argued, right? So I'm, I'm not gonna argue for every little thing that um, I, I mentioned in this section, but they are arguable. So if you wanna challenge me on some of it or ask me more about why I'm positing something that looks weird to you, um, you really should do that. Okay, so if you take nothing out of this section though, I want you to take out this blue message, um, quite a lot of important and interesting meaning is compositional. Um, so one of the main moves um, that I did in my book was uh, undo a certain core assumption of degree semantics, namely for the specialist that gradable adjectives um, introduce measure functions. So I'm gonna show you that, I'm not gonna tell you that. Okay, so what's a comparative? Well, a comparative expresses um, relations between measurements. Um, so if we take this kind of sentence, Al drank hotter coffee than Bill did. Um, this is kind of a, 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 a challenge case for, for my particular approach. So I'm gonna show you how it works there. Um, so this little morpheme here, er, we take to express a comparison relation. Um, and unpacking the sentence a little bit, undoing the ellipsis, we find that the matrix clause and the than clause both introduce measurements. Um, an interesting question is what introduces, uh, I should say what those measurements are. So the degree to, uh, to which Al's coffee was hot, the degree to which Bill's coffee was hot. And those are the two things that we're gonna uh, compare. So the interesting question for me is really um, what introduces measurement values, right? So when you do the compositional semantics, which piece of that uh, sentence structure is giving us these measurement values? Um, and so on my view, um, uh, it's not what it looks on the surface. So, um, so let's take that sentence we had again, I'll drink hotter coffee, the er morpheme introduces the comparison relation. Um, I actually posit that there's this silent morpheme that you don't hear called much. Uh, and that's the one that's doing the interesting job with respect to measurement values. So it's a, a compositional introduction of measurement values, even in the cases where you don't see that guy on the surface. Um, here's what it would look like semantically. We just say descriptively um, its job, the, the job of this much that shows up whenever you have an er, whenever you have an as, isn't as much, too much, so much, how much, et cetera. Um, uh, what it does is it introduces a variable over measure functions. Okay. So, Formally, that's what we call them. Um, so if you look uh, uh, at the sort of piece of formal stuff I've got at the top that says the interpretation of much is, well, basically whatever mapping from whatever you want um, to measurement values. So it says I'm a function from alpha to the measure of alpha. Um, and the measure there is left uh, under specified. Um, the alphas here, I understand them to range over entities, events, states, basically whatever kinds of things we take there to be. Um, now, if you're a philosopher and you buy the extension dogma at this point, you'd be like, oh my gosh, you're going to have such a crazy rich ontology. It's like, yes, that's true, if you understand what I'm saying that way. But here, of course, we're understanding it to mean um, we have these classes of representations, these things that cluster concepts of events, concepts of objects, concepts of states, and so on. Um, so looking back at our little sentence, Al drank hot, hotter coffee, hot butcher coffee, um, it's hot actually in this case that will introduce the measured entity. And what it'll introduce is a state of heat, namely one instantiated by the coffee. Um, so the dimensionality that is the resolution of mu in the formal theory um, depends on what's measured. That's the way this theory is set up. Um, that is uh, measurement values, the ones that we uh, understand and represent when we uh, uh, comprehend a comparative sentence, Measurement values depend in predictable ways on the conceptual class targeted. So it's not just like, you know, you know, a, a mishmash of, oh, give me this adjective, give me that adjective, and I'll get like whatever kinds of uh, 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 dimensions. There are these class level generalizations that we can witness. Um, uh, and the thing that I'm going to emphasize for my goal of illuminating compositional meaning is uh, that which con conceptual class we're targeting is acutely tuned to the functional syntax. Okay, so what I want to start with are some intuitions. This will be familiar. These sorts of intuitions will be familiar to anyone um, sort of looking at the mass count plurality literature. But what I want to do is um, that stuff I think is pretty familiar in the object substance distinction in cognition is pretty familiar probably to everybody here. Um, but I'm going to show you that stuff, but then use it to draw the analogy that I've developed in my own work with um, event process uh, cognition. So this is a case where um, I've leveraged the formal semantic theory to hopefully gain some insight into certain categories of mind. Okay, so let's start with the intuitions. Um, so this is, let's say, whatever 
Al has and whatever Bill has. So A and B, um, there it is. And suppose we can truthfully describe it as these are their gleings, or I understand that to be some kind of plural noun you've never heard before, gleings. Um, and suppose I can also truthfully describe this as this is their wadal. Again, where you don't know what wadal means. Um, now, um, okay, so imagine what you might think those words mean in this context. Now, suppose I ask you, is it true that A has more gleings? Think about what you might say about that, uh, or if it's true that A has more wadal. Now, if you're like me, and like most people, I've asked questions like this, but not exactly these questions, so hopefully I don't bomb this. Um, but if you're like me, and, and a lot of folks uh, with similar examples, you'll take the first sentence to be true and the second one to be false in this context. Isn't that fascinating? Look how much you know about what these sentences mean when you don't know what the words are in them. Um, now, um, the reason I, would, I, I will show you that you take, if you're like me, you take the first sentence to be true is because you're tracking number in this case. And in the second case, you take it to be false because you're tracking something like volume or weight, like you're mapping these sort of pixels or color differences onto some continuous dimension along which you can compare these two. And um, hopefully the examples are set up well enough that you take it that there's more along those dimensions on the right than on the left. Okay, so here's the parallel I wanna set up with, uh, uh, well, the parallel I wanna set up, I'll try to avoid the jargon here. Um, so. This is a schematic representation of the English Channel. So we've got this fish, um, there's Dover and there's Cap Green A. And here's what happened. There the fish went. Okay, I'm gonna represent this abstractly like this. So there's the path. And let's say the thickness of the line tells you something about, I don't know, the time spent that the fish was uh, doing its thing. Um, and now let's consider these cases. So there's there's the fish A and there's the fish B and there's whatever they did, there's whatever happened. And suppose that I can describe this as these are their cawings. Um, again, they're with the plural morpheme or verbally they cawed so many times. So these are their cawings or they cawed so many times. Um, say I can truthfully describe this that way or I could describe this, this is their smiming. This is all their smiming. Um, or they smimed for a long time. Um, now, again, um, if we embed these novel de-verbal nouns in the comparative, so A did more cawings, or A cawed more, um, A did more smiming, or A smimed more, um, depending on how you were thinking about those things, but if uh, those, the mapping between those expressions and the scenes, if you're like me, you'll take the first one to be true. So indeed, A did more cawings, um, but the second would be false. Um, it is not the case that A did more smiming. Um, and again, if you're like me, it's because the first one you're thinking about number uh, and the second one you're thinking something about distance or duration. So um, do I, how many puzzled faces do I see? Jeff's worries me, but he smiled. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so there's just intuitions, right? We have these intuitions about what novel words mean in these simple little contexts. And then we port those intuitions quite directly over to dimensional interpretation with the comparative. Um, so here I wanna show you the hypothesized syntax conceptual alignments that are undergirding these intuitions. Okay, so here's that kind of thing in the first place that we called some, some that we could call some wadle. You might think, well, I could also call it some metal, some wire, some cable, et cetera, depending on what, um, depending on what you're thinking about. Um, the occurrence of the, the relevant nominal syntax in this case is just a noun stem. Okay, so it's, it's some kind of thing that introduces an end meaning. Um, now, if we look at, so this is the part where we're looking at the semantics, the formal semantics of mass count. If we consider what, what the noun meaning applies to given this syntax, so the blue box is gonna, uh, is gonna uh, correspond to whatever's in the blue box, let's say has that property, that little lambda x, n of x property. Okay, so is some weightal, whatever's in the blue box. Now, interestingly, if we divide that stuff up basically any way we like, whatever's in those divisions also counts as some weightal. That's the way this noun reference works in this kind of context. We say it's divisive. Um, we have the possibility of divisive reference. So this kind of syntactic context is conducive, we might think, to what we intuitively think of as substance concepts. Um, so substance concepts seem to have this divisiveness kind of, this is water, take arbitrary subparts, that's all water, this is metal, take arbitrary subparts, this is uh, metal. Um, so this kind of uh, context is conducive to substance concepts, but it doesn't specify anything about uh, uh, substance concepts. Witness, mass nouns like furniture, which don't apply to substances. We can talk about that if you like. People really care about that one. Um, I do too, I have a paper coming out. <laughs> so, so, um, now consider in this case where we have a gleaning um, or a, a ring, a circle. So now we're using a singular definite article. In this kind of context, there's different ways of representing it. I'm not making any novel claims about the, uh, the syntax or semantics here. 
but I'm going to show you the way um, uh, it's generally thought about. When you have that kind of context, what you're uh, at, what you have is not only, okay, whatever the noun meaning is, and then whatever's in that circle counts as an instance of the, the noun meaning, um, but no arbitrary subparts of that, or at least most or whatever, but you just can't divide that up and find more instances of the same thing, right? So here the black uh, uh, divisions are saying, no, no, stuff in me, don't fall under that. Uh, uh, under that meaning. So this is um, basically the syntax imposes a certain what we call atomicity requirements, right? So the whole thing counts. If the whole thing counts as the end meaning, then no arbitrary divisions of it do. So this is what we mean to say that something refers atomically. Um, this syntactic context is conducive to object concepts, um, it seems, because they, they're the kind of thing that we like to think of as atomic, right? Like um, once you've got the, the statue or whatever, you can't just like cut it in half and have two statues, et cetera. Um, okay. Um, and then finally, the plural case, what's interesting about the plural case is just that it presupposes this kind of atomicity, right? So you saw this in Paul's talk, uh, talk one way of representing that, um, which has interesting cross-linguistic uh, support for it, is to think that when you hear gleings or rings or circles or loops, you actually have um, this count morpheme appearing, even though you don't hear it, right? So um, what's going on here? Well, again, if you take sort of um, uh, divisions of this stuff, if the divisions contain the whole, call them objects in this case, um, then um, any one of those subdivisions will count as an instance of gleings or rings. Um, however, the atomicity requirement, which is baked in there, doesn't let you cut up those, those objects. So you have sort of, a, you have sort of a, um, a plural part of kind of relation, but you have minimal parts, which are the objects that satisfy the singular description. Okay, so um, pluralities presuppose atomic minimal parts, and so these work with object descriptions. Okay, now here's the parallel case. This is the part that's gonna be less familiar, um, potentially more abstract. Um, but say we take whatever that fish did again, and we call this some sminging. So we're in a context where we're thinking of it as some sminging. Um, here, what you have is a bare verb now, which expresses a property of events. Um, and just like with the bare uh, mass occurrence of a noun, you can divide that stuff, any, stuff up any way you like, and you'll have more instances of the same thing. So all of this was the sminging, this was the sminging, this was the sminging, this was the sminging. So um, you have this kind of divisive reference, um, both for uh, 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 bare occurrences of verbs as you do with bare occurrences of nouns. And so here what we have um, is, a, is a syntactic context, which is conducive to process concepts. So I think this divisiveness is a property of um, uh, process concepts. Um, but again, the syntax or the semantics doesn't specify. You must have non-divisive reference. Reference. Okay, um, singular description, a uh, calling or call once, a uh, crossing, cross once. Um, same thing, you have some verbal equivalent of the count morpheme, so something that says, however you refer, you must refer atomically. So that whole event counts as a crossing of the English Channel by the fish, for example, but no arbitrary subpart of it does. Um, and then you can pluralize here as well. So, you know, use the de verbal noun to refer to it plurally. So, cawings, crossings, um, or caw again and again. English doesn't do verbal plurality very well, just like it doesn't do verbal aspect very well. But you can find languages that have verbal expression of these hypothesized morphemes, uh, which is fascinating that um, what you get overtly in these other languages seems to correspond with the kinds of interpretations that we get as if they were there. Um, okay, so same kind of structure here. If you pluralize the thing, um, all the stuff in all these blue boxes counts as instances. Of, uh, so all the subsets, as long as you um, uh, bottom out at events, um, but arbitrary subparts of those events um, don't count. So here, plurality is, pre uh, I forgot to say. Yeah, so here you have uh, contexts which are conducive to event uh, conceptualization. Um, these are the things in the dynamic domain which are conceived of as atomic. Um, and so plural, uh, uh, plurals again presuppose um, bottoming out in atoms. Okay, so I think this is the last little part of the semantics of comparatives. Um, so there are three uh, formal conditions that govern the, the distribution and specific interpretation of more. Um, and these conditions are fine tuned to the kinds of distinctions that I just laid out for you. Um, so I'm going to just show you two of them. Um, to try to keep things contained here. Um, so the first one is called monotonicity, and that is um, the dimensions that you select for more alpha um, are relativized to a base ordering. So basically, thinking about this in internalist, internalistic terms, classes of concepts come with um, ways of thinking about these things as ordered, a primitive base ordering. Um, so if we take this situation, given some sminging or swim that time, we're thinking um, you know, process -y. Um, what we represent is a part whole ordering on um, stretches of swimming activity. And monotonicity, what it says is if you combine with an expression that has this kind of representation, then the dimensions must uh, preserve strict ordering relations um, thereof, right? So if you take this as the totality of the swimming event, here's an arbitrary subpart, it must be that whatever dimension you pick 
assigns a larger measurement value to the whole than to the parts. So duration will do that, for example, like the entirety of the event takes longer than any arbitrary subparts. Um, so the monotonicity condition says, take a look at what you're representing. How is it ordered? And then find some measurement that tracks that. So um, duration will do it in this case, they, uh, distance will do it, but something like effort expended won't do it. Um, why do I want to say this is class-based? Well, you'll get the same thing with running and sleeping and waiting, um, but you won't get the same thing with like wanting or needing, right? If you uh, want something more, that doesn't mean like you spent, well, it's actually ambiguous, but um, let me see. Well, at lunch, I wanted pizza more than you wanted cupcakes. Doesn't have anything to do with duration. It has to do with intensity. And that's because you're talking about states, something else. Um, okay, so that's what I just said. Duration is monotonic. So this is what monotonicity gets you. Uh, the second condition is automorphism invariance. Okay, so we don't need to dwell on this. What it does is it guarantees you that once you've got a plural structure, the only conceivable measure is number. So um, automorphism invariance guarantees that the dimensions you pick are strongly structure, pres uh, structure preserving. So it just ramps up like how, how much attention you need to pay to the, uh, the base ordering. So for example, if we take this situation depicted here and we're given some crossings, so we're thinking about this in terms of the pluralities of crossings, um, uh, we represent a plural part of relation with atoms as minimal parts. Now, um, both a measure like duration and number will be monotonic. They will satisfy the first condition with respect to such an ordering. But of course, intuitions do not suggest that you can ever interpret, for example, I have more toys than you do as like the weight of my toys is greater than the weight of your toys or something, right? So when we have plural market expressions, we need to rule out things like weight in the nominal domain. We need to rule out things like duration uh, in the uh, verbal domain. So what automorphism invariance gets you is that only number will map each n membered plurality to the same value. And that's, so we don't need to dwell on those details. You could just, rep, if it's plural, you get number. That's the way it will be. Okay, so interim summary dimensionality strongly is strongly related to and revealing of conceptual class. So I didn't um, argue for this, but really if you think of any examples that are relevantly like metal or like water or whatever, or intuitively like substance concepts, and then hopefully if you do your core knowledge work and you find operations defined for those things or all, you know, there's a substance cognition box and all the words for stuff in that box, you will find um, the dimension uh, predicted is the same. Similarly for process, you get duration, objects uh, and events, pluralities anyway, you get number. Um, second, um, uh, uh, certain distinctions, certain of these conceptual distinctions are recorded in uh, or affected by syntactic structure that is often quiet. Um, so you don't hear the CT morpheme, the count morpheme in English, it's overt in other languages. Um, you don't hear the verbal plural, um, but that is also overt in other languages. So what I've set up here is the syntactic semantics theory where those things are present, even for you English speaker, whether you hear them or recognize it um, or not. And they have the uh, uh, interpretive consequences um, that I've, I've suggested. Okay, so now I wanna to turn to, um, you know, sort of uh, that all setting up for us um, a certain way of thinking about the structures in the linguistic cognition and um, some of the structures in non-linguistic cognition and how they're interrelated in the context of comparatives. Um, now what I wanna show you is sort of the influence of representing those syntactic structures as they are, um, how that influences um, uh, how you choose the dimensions for comparison. So this is um, uh, sort of uh, formal experimental work looking at um, the syntax people's syntactic sensitivity and their understanding of more sentences. Oh, and I should say this is um, joint work with Angela Shashwehe, who's uh, faculty at the Hong Kong Baptist University. Okay, um, so here's the case study, um, quiet syntax and sentences with all the same words. So I haven't shown you these sentences yet. Um, oh, yeah, so I haven't shown you any of these sentences yet, but I'm going to get to the test sentences by first wandering through um, a verbal case. We're going to look at adjectives. Okay, so take this sentence, Anne ran around the neighborhood more than Bill did. Um, this sentence has two uh, kinds of interpretations of that comparative, so you can interpret it as a comparison by duration, for example, is the answer to the question, how much did she run around the neighborhood? Um, you can also hear it as a comparison by number, like how many times did she run around the neighborhood? Um, in my 2012 paper with um, Valentin Accard and um, um, Rumiana Pancheva, we argued for an ambiguity analysis of this. So in the case where you get duration, what you're, what you're doing is representing a bare verb being targeted by the comparative. So targeting the process of running. Um, and there, of course, you get uh, duration versus um, uh, uh, you can um, target a plural structure. So one where you've actually um, pluralized in there and you're measuring pluralities of occasions of running. 
Um, so in English, you just have this ambiguity. If you go over languages like Bulgarian or Hindi or whatever, where they actually mark the relevant aspect, you can disambiguate these sentences. So it's like, well, if you need those other syntaxes for languages like Hindi, let's just suppose that English speakers are just sort of indeterminate between those two syntactic structures, um, but everything works uh, 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 as, we, as we think it should, um, given, given this sort of uh, assumption. Okay, so we have this um, case. Okay, so I wanna show you is a, um, what I think of as a kind of um, a similar kind of uh, maneuver in the verbal domain, um, but looking at gradable adjectives. So um, uh, sentences like Anne was more patient than Bill was. So if we target that particular faculty meeting, Anne was more patient than Bill was, we understand that as um, being about the intensity of the patients or the how much patience kind of question. So you can use that sentence to answer a question like how patient was Anne at the meeting? Versus say last week, say across all these, we had just tons of meetings. Um, we can say something, well, last week Anne was patient more than Bill was, specifically intending it as an answer to a question like how often was she patient, something like that. So the word order difference where the more occurs post-adjectively as opposed to pre-adjectively comes along with apparently this um, dimensional difference. Now on the view that um, I advocate, what we'll say is that when the more occurs pre-adjectively, it's measuring states of being patient. So it's just a like standard, that's like saying Anne drank hotter coffee. Right, so it's just um, the states are introduced by the adjective and more applies to those and the dimensional sensitivity is resolved appropriately. Um, versus the post-adjectival more position is actually revealing to us that there's a little more syntax in there, right? So what you're actually measuring or what you're targeting for measurement is a phrase that's actually plural marked. Okay, so something like uh, measuring pluralities of occasions of being patient. Um, so the word order of the comparative here is cueing you to some of this abstract syntax that you don't hear. Okay, so the question is, do people make the hypothesized syntax semantics connections, right? So I can do this all day and I got this book to defend, right? So, um, you know, I, I would have to say this, um, but do ordinary folks uh, make these connections? So what we did in the experiment was, um, so it's a sentence animation verification task. So we're just gonna ask people, um, show them an animation and a sentence and ask them, does the sentence accurately describe what they saw? Um, and these tasks involved uh, entities, two boxes, and they vary in their degree of blueness roughly even steps from an independently measured prototype, flashing different numbers of times, right? So each time you see one of these boxes doing something, there's gonna be an interpretation in terms of the grade of blueness or an interpretation in terms of how many times the thing did it. Okay, so here are the three degrees of blueness that we used and here's what the flashing looks like. Okay. So, um, so a kind of um, quality type reading um, and a kind of event type reading. Okay, so um, display of two boxes, each is varying in blueness and number. I'll just show you a sample trial here. Bunk. So there's gonna be two types of trials. So on the, what I'm calling the tie trials, you have the same winner along both dimensions, um, both along the dimension of blueness and the dimension of number. And on the other half, you have uh, the non-tie trials, you have, um, one of the box wins by number, but not blueness uh, and vice versa. Okay, so roughly half the time um, uh, you'll have that kind of split. And then we just manipulated the sentence between subjects. Okay, so here are the sentences. A was bluer than B was, it was more blue than B was, um, and A was blue more than B was. Um, we wanted to see whether there might be some difference between the syntactic difference in bluer and more blue. Um, there is a little, which is kind of interesting, but I'm not gonna dwell on it. You can ask me about it if you like. Um, so here's what we predicted. In the case where you have blue or more blue, this is syntactically, you've got that more deep down next to the adjective measuring states. You're not gonna go along the number dimension. In the case of A was blue more than B was where the different syntactic realization of more is cueing you to this covert plural construction. Um, here, you're gonna interpret by number. Okay, so here's how I'm gonna represent uh, the results. So I'm plotting consistency with number on the y-axis. So if you were high up there, that means you were, you were going based on uh, the number dimension. Um, and the tie trials, those where the two dimensions agreed are gonna be on the right and the non-tie trials, um, the ones that we really care about are gonna be on the left. Okay, so here's what we see in the tie trials. Now here, if you said yes to the question, yes, it matches, yes, the animation and the sentence match, um, you will get a one here because number and blueness both agree, right? So if our subjects are rational, we're gonna see these bars being high and that's what we see and that's good. That means people are doing all right in this task, right? So nothing informative about um, our question here. Um, if we look at uh, the bluer and more blue, 
these look as expected. So you're getting close to floor in the non-tie trials. So this suggests that there, people are really thinking about blueness rather than number when they interpret these two sentences. So that is also good. Now a question, what happens when we move the more to a post-adjectival position? Well, here on the face of it, you're getting more number consistency, but it's not a ton. Like I could talk about this in a couple of different ways, right? Like I'd be like, see, we were right. It's more than the other two, but actually I would have thought we'd get something categorical here. So it's like, how come this guy isn't more than half? Well, aha, because <laughs> if you look at the by subject averages, so this is now plotting for each subject, their average yes response. Um, people were internally consistent at opposite poles. This wasn't like they were like occasionally tempted by this reading and you know, it was like, actually, no, no, no. They were, they were thinking blueness or they were thinking number. Well, it turns out, thanks to a crafty syntactician who I think was here earlier, um, this is actually grammatically licensed and me, poor semanticist, hadn't thought about it. So the participants in the top zone there, they're getting the A plural reading that we thought people would get. And those people on the bottom, they're getting um, actually a construction which is targeting the A meaning on a heavy modifier shift parse. So basically, uh, if you consider things like, well, Patty was patient more than Bill was anyway, um, you can get the intensity of patients reading there, but what you've done is you've just shifted that more to a post uh, a post adjectival position. So it's not a semantically significant movement or extra position as it's called, um, uh, but it's, yeah, it's available. So in the absence of any prosodic cues um, for our participants to know which reading we interpret, we intended them to interpret, this is actually a pretty rational uh, uh, pattern as well. Um, why do I say prosody? Well, if you say Patty was patient, more than Bill was anyway, that's the prosody you want for this heavy modifier shift parse. And you get it with Bill was a man proud of his son. You get this kind of heavy break in between um, uh, the two expressions, as opposed to Patty was patient more than Bill was, kind of boring prosody. Okay, so that's interesting, but we can do better. Um, so if number interpretations are really cued by quiet syntax and not say just by special senses of an adjective like blue or something like that, we expect the same pattern plugging a nonce word in there, a nonce like glebe. Um, and with the same test, then we can also test, um, we can throw a novel verb in there um, and that should exclude the possibility of this heavy modifier shift parse, right? Like there's no sense in which you, you have that weird thing that I just described uh, with a verb. Okay, so these are the sentences we tested. So it's the same thing, but we tested these sentences. A was gleeber than B was, that's A or it was more glebe, more A. Um, a was glebe more, that's the post-adjectival more and A glebe more than B, that's V more. Okay, so what we predicted again was the first two guys would go with the non-number, so blueness dimension, um, and the bottom two guys would go with number. Okay, so the same graph setup, same sentence conditions plus the addition of that verbal condition. Um, again, if you look at the tie trials, so the cases where the two dimensions agree, people are being rational, they're just, you know, they're picking one or the other, we don't know, but they're, you know, they're, they're up high, like being consistent with this, uh, so they're rational. Um, when we look at the, um, the sentences targeting A, where more targets just the adjective, they look very much like they did before. Um, perhaps there's some more attraction to number than in the first experiment, and that's fine. The adjective, we didn't tell them what the adjective means, so they could, they could think about more flashy or something. Um, in the case of A more, we get, again, greater attraction to number with the hypothesized A plural construction, but again, not categorically so, right? Um, so what happens with the verb? So not categorically so, okay, well then maybe when we look at the subject averages, we're gonna see people are getting this, uh, uh, resolving the ambiguity in a different way. But what do we see with the verb case, which shouldn't allow for the ambiguity? Well, we get um, uh, the pattern that we'd expect, uh, a clearly categorical preference for numbers. So people hear, uh, you know, A glebed more than B and they're focusing on the flashing and they're um, judging by number. Um, and indeed, if you look at the subject averages, you get more or less uh, the pattern that we saw before with the A more. So people are more or less, um, this data is noisier obviously than all adjective, but more or less you're getting people are choosing one or the other interpretation and with the verb they're they're not really doing that. Okay, so now I'm going to show you the other direction of the bioconditional. So I'm going to suggest that speakers class level representation now of their experience determines the syntax and the dimensions accordingly. Um, so this is showing the conceptual sensitivity of the resolution of the dimensional selection for more. Okay, so the Amor sentences um, really should allow us to probe the trade-off between lexical, conceptual, um, and grammatical factors in a surprising way. So I need to kind of complexify um, and actually precisify um, the syntax semantics here a bit to make this point. Um, uh, so uh, in the previous experiments, I just presumed that you could actually do this a plural thing, um, but you actually can't do that. Um, there's a whole wide literature on the relationship between state of predicates and individuation, and it actually literally doesn't make sense. You just throw the plural on the adjective meaning. I don't need to get into huge detail about it, but um, I was oversimplifying there. And 
it was allowable given the parameters I was setting up for my experiment. But here to show you uh, this study, you need to appreciate the finer grain details. So the plural, as I showed you at the beginning, presupposes atomicity, right? So it wants these minimal parts, which are not further divisible. Um, state of predicates aren't usually assumed to provide this, at least not in the relevant sense. Um, so we need to add a bit more structure here. Um, so this is what we saw before with the post adjectival more. So Anne was patient more than Bill was. We just said, oh, this measures pluralities of occasions of being patient. And that's why you get number interpretation if your parse of the sentence has this structure. Um, but the theoretically allowable options here are actually that you could just measure a process defined in terms of the, sta the state of patients holding, or you could measure a plurality of such, uh, such processes. So here's what those structures would look like. Imagine this kind of morpheme called PR details here. This is new work. Um, I need to like work out a little bit better. So we're just gonna kind of code it this way. So basically what the function of this little thingy is, is to get you out of the state of domain and into the event of domain. Just get me out of the states and get me something eventy. And I'm gonna call it a process. The process that you get, is just this derived one. It's like, I am a process which is defined in terms of a certain state's holding. So there's a temporal constitution relation between them, much like when you individuate a rock and you say, look, I'm a novel entity um, comprised of some rock, except we're doing this in the, um, the dynamic domain. Um, so only once you've sort of put that morpheme in there and you're playing in the land where atoms are possible, now you can pluralize. I actually think you're going to need to count morpheme in there too, so don't hit me. Um, now I'll just footnote. Um, there's an analysis of Russian copular alternation. So if anybody speaks Russian or um, um, certain related languages, um, there's some interesting morphological stuff that happens in these copular constructions, which indeed brings in this kind of event of meaning. So I think we'll see in the fullness of time. I'm well grounded linguistically here. Okay, so here's the idea. If it's grammatically possible to interpret the sequence A more as targeting process as opposed to pluralities, then scene conceptualization could determine dimensionality for this A more construction. Um, so given scenes inviting divisive ref reference, like if you just, you're viewing the scene, you're just thinking, geez, this is what I'm seeing is of a certain type and arbitrary ways of cutting it up are of the same type. You're not thinking this explicitly, of course, right? But if you just see it that way, then you should be representing it as a process and measure by duration. Versus if you're given scenes that invite atomic categorizations, you just think like, look, once I got like one of these things, I, it's one and I can't just arbitrarily cut that thing up and like have more instances of the same thing. So if you're thinking about this thing in terms of at atomic reference, then you should, um, you should interpret the sentence as being pluralized and interpret by number. Okay, so here's kind of the idea. So if X plus that weird like map me from a state to a process morpheme, what you get is a representation of uh, something that is true of parts of process. And so if the representation invites thinking arbitrary divisiveness like this is possible, duration. In contrast, if you're thinking, I can sort of think about pluralities of this stuff, but I can't just take parts of the minimal events, um, uh, then I'm thinking plural and I should just measure by number. Okay, so we did another sentence animation verification task. We got two boxes as before, but this time we're pitting number and duration against one another. So we're gonna be two scene types, one meant to evoke flashing type events and another designed to evoke glow, glowing type process. Um, and we manipulated which scene type you saw between subjects. And again, we have tie trials and non-tie trials. So in the tie trials, the same box will have both more uh, of what's going on in terms of number and it will take more time doing it. Um, uh, uh, you know, and, and so on, play it out. So the same box wins along both dimensions. And then the non tire trials where the opposite box wins on each dimension. So if box A wins on number, then box B wins on duration uh, and vice versa. Okay, so here are the scene types. Here's how they were designed. So for flash, we were trying to evoke something that would make people think atomic events. So what we did was construct these scenes where you go from dis in discrete steps from black to now focusing on a prototypical blue. So here's what, so this is like, He's black for a period of time and he's blue for a period of time, black. So he discrete steps through the through the color. That's what it looks like. Okay, so that's just what we used before, right in the previous experiment where we wanted an eventy dimension. Um, the glow scenes have multiple discrete steps from black to blue, but the overall effect is continuous. So there's something countable that you could extract here, but you don't, it just doesn't seem like you have to. It feels like an ongoing uh, activity, all of which is glowing anyway, of sort of parsing it out is, is glowing. So it looks like that. Okay, so that's what differentiates our flash and glow is just whether you've got that type of animation or this type of animation. Now, sometimes how long you spend glowing or how long you spend flashing, is gonna depend because sometimes our dimensions are correlated and sometimes they're anti-correlated. So here the sentence was just A was blue more than B was and then um, the different scene types. 
okay, so what do we predict? Well, if people are given the glow type scenes, if we've done our job and the glow type scenes are invoking divisive process reference and the background theory is as I said it is, then people should think duration when they get those scenes. Um, and flash, if we've done our job and we've isolated, people are gonna think events for this case and the background theory is as I said it is, then people should be thinking number here. Okay, so we find, um, Plotting the data in the same way, so it's consistency with number on the y-axis, tie trials again on the right, non-tie on the left. Well, the first thing you'll notice is that in the tie trials, it's noisier than it was before. So people are not like hanging around in the 92% zone, um, but it's still sensible. So we'll keep probing this and we'll see what we find. Um, but overall, it looks like people are being rational here. Um, in the flash, non-tie trials, it's almost as high uh, in, uh, uh, as in the tie trials as we predicted, right? So here's 50, whoops. Here's 50%. People are well above 50%. I haven't done the stats on any of this yet. I apologize. Um, the people are well above 50% here, suggesting they're thinking about number when you give them these flash date scenes. Now, what about glow? Well, you get the opposite preference. So people are well below chance. Hopefully that's real statistically, but people are well below chance here, suggesting they're thinking about duration when, um, uh, when they're given the glow type scenes. So that's what we expected. Um, if you look at the bi-subject averages, people are not nearly as internally consistent here as they were before. So it's not like, like the first set of data suggested, like for one case, there's like two actual parses and people are like picking one and like settling on one. Here, if it's a difference of two available parses, um, it's not like people are just picking one and settling on it. Rather, it seems like they're vacillating between the one and the other. Um, uh, uh, so people are not as internally consistent here as they were. So we're getting the population difference, but there's some probing work that needs to be done here. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, I suggested taking an interface approach, um, thinking about linguistic meaning as a bridge between linguistic and non-linguistic cognition. And so using semantic description as a means of um, not only illuminating sort of uh, 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 what's going on on the morphosyntactic side, but also potentially what's going on on uh, the conceptual perceptual side. Um, I assumed that, well, that's what I just said, um, and why bother with this? You guys don't need to be told, but some, some, some of my friends in the philosophy department and stuff do, but why bother with this? Well, you get better explanations um, for language typology, language learning and language understanding. We know that very much of the way the mind is structured appears to be shared. Um, it's a species level kind of property. And we know that there's a lot of commonalities across the world's languages as well. And so we can start to um, both syntactically, morphologically and semantically. So we can start to ground um, uh, uh, better explanations by drawing on this connection. Um, and what I did today was try to establish bi-directional links between sort of grammatical glue. So things like the count morpheme, the plural morpheme, this mucher business. Um, so um, to establish and um, sort of provide evidence for um, tight bi-directional links between that sort of glue um, and classes of mental representation. Um, I use comparatives as diagnostic of derivational relationships between classes. And this is something that um, people definitely like to use more um, uh, sort of generally as a kind of diagnostic of how people are thinking about things. Um, and I think you can think of this formal theory as kind of grounding, formal interface theory as kind of grounding um, what those studies tend to show. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alexis. We'll take some questions for just Alexis before we open it up. Um, so if you have a question, please step forward to the microphone, so to speak. Should I stop my share? Yeah, I want to see our faces a bit better. Um, we'll take the first question from Matthew. Hello, thank you. Um, I Hi. didn't know that interface theory existed. Um, so, so I'd like to know if there's a history that I should be aware of. <laughs> Yeah, I, I realized I, I did a very bad job of plugging my friends in this talk, like Paul did a better job. Um, so yes, so I mean, I really think the the sort of seminal work, Jeff, can I call it a seminal work, um, is, is um, it's LIDS at all 2011. So where they give a name to it, the interface transparency thesis, right? So I mean, this is the kind of thing that people tend to cite and say, what I'm thinking about is um, at a certain default level, something like that, um, there's a, a really close relationship between um, the pieces of the morphosyntactic representation and the kinds of rules and representations that are uh, invoked in cognition. Um, there's, you know, so they work out in that 2011 paper, which, so it's, <laughs> amongst friends, we call it the, the work that was going on in the most group. Um, I've never heard it called interface theory before. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, but yeah, so you want to take a look at Petrovsky et al. 2009. So Paul mentioned that work, which is, you know, kind of looking at whether you can find psycho, psycho linguistic evidence for the interpretation of most as being um, essentially about number as opposed to say some kind of human one-to-one -one correspondence. 
Um, and then, so they show some experimental work suggestive of uh, the conclusion that indeed most is about number. Um, and then in um, the LIDS et al. 2011, um, they sort of expand that uh, looking at whether um, you seem to be carrying out say subtraction operations as opposed to a series of selection operations in vision um, in order to um, uh, evaluate most. So, so it's sort of, here are some candidate some formal semantic specifications of the meaning of sentences like most of the dots are blue. And can we sort of reduce um, the set of possible, like interpreting those formal specifications as, um, uh, you know, sort of level one and a half kind of, here's the information relevant for cognition to carry out when you evaluate the sentence. Can we sort of reduce the set, uh, uh, the space of possible uh, uh, formal representations to sort of get at what kinds of representations are being recruited. Um, so that's kind of the land that like I was hanging out um, in in graduate school. There's a couple other papers. Um, so looking at the interpretation of more with respect to substance versus objects. So Darko Odic et al has um, papers on this. Um, and then we also, Paul mentioned a paper, um, uh, a couple of papers with Tyler Knowlton that look at, um, so one that I wasn't involved in um, uh, has to do with the interpretation of universal quantifiers like each and every, um, and one that I was involved in compares uh, visual set selection operations with the interpretation of uh, more and most sentences in extensionally equivalent circumstances. So like most of the dots are blue, more of the dots are blue. In cases where you just have blue dots and yellow dots, the truth value you get for those two sentences is the same for every variation of the, the ratio of the numbers of those two things. Um, but what we show in that paper is, um, is that, you know, there's ways of teasing out that people when they get the more sentence are visually trying to select the blue independently from the yellow. Whereas when they get the most sentence, they're trying to think of the dots full superset in comparison with um, uh, uh, the, the focal um, uh, uh, blue set. So, and then there's, uh, Paul had some other sessions, but so this is the, the little group where I think this kind of work um, has been playing out in the past like 10 years or so. I don't know. We have a question from Ellen. Uh, this, it's a, I, I guess this is still Alexis's part, but it's something that both Alexis and Paul mentioned. So I was just interested in the way that you framed it at the beginning as um, thoughts are complex concepts. And I was just kind of intrigued as to like, why, um, why might I say that rather than say that a complex concept is yet another thing? Like, what's the thing that makes me want to call both the long-term memory thing a concept and then the comp you know the thing that I compose online of the those bits also call it a concept mm. why, why do I want to call one a Ooh. simple concept and one a complex concept rather than just say um this is a simple concept and this is something else <laughs> love it um so there's there's one question you're asking, which I think I, I can just sort of address, and the other I think is getting into that um, part where I said questions, questions, specialist issues here. Um, but so what I meant by sort of primitive concept and complex concept is the primitive one is like, let's say, let's just go full photo here, right? So the primitive concept, let's say, is an atomic symbol, um, an atomic representation. So there's no internal structure to the, to the conceptual representation. Um, so say you think that we have an atomic concept of cows, then there just is a mental symbol, which um, has to do with cows, it's possession of that in virtue of which we're able to categorize cows as such, etc. Um, uh, now, if you have something like, I'm using Paul's examples, but if you, you know, now if you have brown cow, like, people could argue, you could say, no, 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 we, you know, there's a primitive concept brown cow, but we don't usually think that way, right? Like we think if you're representing brown cows as such, you know, you're representing some kind of composition of two concepts, your concepts of brown things as such, and your concept of uh, cows as such, and now there's some kind of uh, composite concept. So that would be a complex concept in the sense of non-atomic. Now, but what makes thought, it a concept? What makes that thing called a concept rather than um, something else. I guess like there's other cases where like the atoms aren't called the same things as the combinations of the atoms. You know what I mean? Like if you thought oh. morphemes are the pieces of syntax, you don't say that a sentence is a complex morpheme or people don't usually say that. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm just following tradition here actually. Um, and then just to round it off um, and then a thought would be, so I don't know. So I'm, I'm, you know, we say morpheme and then we say like, Phrase. So we have just different words versus we say 
primitive concepts so that guy gets modified and then we say like complex so um so indeed you could change the lingo on the linguistic side to say like just expression which like i prefer following alexander williams right so just expressions and then you know there's ways of talking about the primitive expressions and the complex expressions and maybe special expressions that are you know depending on the extension dogma acceptance like truth of valuable but yeah the thoughts are going to be the complex concepts which are truth of valuable so there's not thought to be any I, I mean, you don't need to assume any particular distinction between the mechanisms that put brown cow together and the ones that put together like Bessie is a brown cow. Um, but Bessie is a brown cow, all caps, has the interesting property of, say, being something we might judge true or false, whereas brown cow isn't. Um, brown cow is something we use to categorize. Um, the other question, <laughs> though, there's, a, there's, a, there's a really interesting questions about what happened between like um, the, let's say, the semantic processing, like, so the getting from this morphosyntactic object, let's say to um, these things that I'm calling concepts. Um, so if you're Paul, right, you're thinking um, what gets done is you get sort of translated into instruction land, but then he also has a layer of what are called linguistic concepts, which are not identical with the say core knowledge concepts. Um, that's just like, that's that was the thing I said, it's just like very specialist-y um, and I could talk with you about all day long, um, but, um, but yeah, what I've tried to just sort of stand back and say is like, you just sort of over there, they're just like, are these concepts? Um, what we don't think are just over there are like all the composites though, right? And that's where the interesting um, questions for thinking about compositional meaning come in, right? So if you buy um, some of, let's say, um, Spelke's arguments that cross-domain concept composition is not possible in the absence of language, then we have this like important explanatory target there to like figure out well, in virtue of what does like say having this linguistic system and compositional semantics doing what it says it does um, that gets us cross domain concept composition like that's like the holy grail in my view and um, I don't I don't know. I'm going to take my privilege to ask Alexis a question before we sort of open up the floor, so if you have a question, please put it in the chat while we're talking. Um, you showed us these two experiments that go in each direction so sort of using language to in, induce some sort of like event representation and then using some sort of event representation to prime a certain interpretation. And in the second direction, you seem to sort of get a noisier pattern of responses. And I'm wondering yeah. what you think that means if, is that noise like coming from the stimuli you have and the perception of them? Or is that coming from a sort of less strong relationship in that direction from the event perception or conception to the language yeah i kind of feel like it's it's a little bit of both but um when i say hot off the presses here i mean like really hot off the presses and i was actually the one doing the data analysis on this round which is like kind of funny um so like so i haven't had you know much time to like really um really think about it but I, it feels to me like there's probably a little bit of both so um and i think it's gonna be really interesting to unpack unpack this question um, so on the side of um, the stimuli, yeah, these um, some of these animations ended up being like 20, 30 seconds long, um, which is really long, <laughs> right? Um, so if you were, for example, like it, it makes me wonder, right? Like in the glow scenes, like you're sitting there watching this thing, like say you need one with like, so it was three to five, right? So say you need five of these glow peaks or whatever, um, and let's say you're at the max uh, duration or whatever. So the very longest animation you could have, it's like 40 seconds. So like whatever you're trying to track and then you're comparing it with one that's like 20 seconds you know number would be easier to track there but say you're trying to track duration like you could imagine a lot of noise being involved in just trying to keep track of the magnitude so i'm working on um completely different versions of not only the glow flash type animations but a whole bunch of other sort of um as minimal as possible um event process pairs that are made in a different way so i'll be able to kind of like test well if we like speed these things up and you know so we just focus on the internal temporal profiles rather than um you know spending more time or whatever um can we get um some cleaner data there and i bet we will okay um that's the first piece and then well the other thing is um there, there's reason to think that it's it's probably going to be an issue for folks who want to uh, posit all of this kind of like, sorry, who are sitting in a 20 minute long experiment or whatever it is, um, and contemplating the same sentence over and over again. Mm -hmm. And we're positing there are these like multiple layers of covert parsing that could be going on. Um, and all of them are grammatically licit and the scenes support either interpretation, right? So it's, it's easy to imagine people kind of bopping around in that space um, in different ways. Um, so, yeah. Okay, we'll take the next question from Judy. 
Hi, Alexis. Um, that was great. I had, hey. I mean, I guess just one related to that comment. My intuition was that Flash and Glow are actually really similar and Glow didn't seem Glow in like the same way that things actually glow. It seemed pretty discreet. I was wondering if that was um, an element of the stimuli. Um, but my other question also was the like the heavy modifier shift problem with the more yep. the blue more. Um, have you run it using the verb construction that you use in the with the glee? Because I think I mean to say so you can say this A blued more than B. Um, we of course don't say that in real life. But my intuition is that you could actually flip like that would even be a stronger um, evidence for your case, right? That like if you enforce this weird. But actually, I think pretty reasonable grammatical construction on the blue. You could get people to like go really high on the event interpretation. Yeah, we we didn't do it because indeed it sounds weird. Um, so we thought, well, all else equal, doing the glebed verb, uh, the the glebed verb one would be getting at that because you know like. <laughs> Uh, well, getting at the question that we were interested in, right, which was like, what's the influence of the syntactic category in the syntactic context and the dimensionality? So if, if we give people blued more, you know, A blued more than B, um, say they give us the response that we expected, like, well, I mean, it's some evidence, right? And I, I, I just, I, I feel like my linguist friend would say like, no, 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 you can't do that because it's like ungrammatical or something. Um, I don't know, it's ungrammatical, but, um, but we could do it. We could do it and just see so that, um, so that my vision science friends will be like, Yes, that's that's the case. Um, what was the first question? Um, oh, I think I I think oh, the glowy and discrete steps. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's very similar to flash. Um, so I wonder if you just change it to something that's like more gradual and actually more glowy than. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So here's the thing. It totally provided a couple of different ways of thinking about it discreetly. And so to think about it in a way that satisfies this atomic reference, which will get you to the plural representation and the number comparison. Um, so it's super interesting that nonetheless, people didn't do that, right? So I think this is, I think the, the more similar they are, yet the more differentiated they are, well, the closer we get to well, what are the sort of boundary differences between these two categories, which is something like I'm really interested in. And I know people in the object substance world are, are interested in as well. Um, but that being said, this new set of animations across different swaths of um, uh, these kinds of semantic fields um, will have like more proper glowing or <laughs> just smoothly transitions. So you could, again, you could count like peak blues, you know, but it's like when you see the kind of real glowing, you're not thinking about peak blue. You're thinking about like the being blue to some extent over time, you know? Um, anyway, great, thank you. The next question is from Gabor. Oh, I have a question to Paul. I'm not sure that I will be able to phrase it well, but I will try. So I, I was very surprised because I always thought that the reason that people assume that uh, language has a extensional meaning is, is is something else, namely to have an explanation of how we succeed in communication. I thought that's the reason, right? Like uh, if I'm talking about things in the world, then somehow people understand me. So for instance, I, we can we can talk about uh, whether your claim was true or false at the end, but I don't see how we can, how we can still have this if we, if we follow what you suggested. How can we, if we, if these things don't have extensions, what does it even mean to be true or false anymore? Like how, how can we evaluate them? And uh, so, so related, I, yeah. I agree. That was part of the hope. Uh, the part of the hope was that if uh, expressions have extensions, then it'll be easy to explain communication in some sense, right? You know, people were never, um, super clear about uh, what exactly successful communication was going to consist in on that view. But I agree that was one of the motivations. Um, but um, uh, I guess I just think it just, it just isn't true. So it's like, it's, it's, it's one thing to say, I'd really like a theory of meaning that will make it super easy to explain how humans communicate with each other. You know, uh, I would also like a, like a pony. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, the facts suggest, I think, that um, that's just not in the cards and that we're stuck with the tough question of how is it that people who in some sense acquire the same language, whatever that means, 
are able to use it to communicate. Now, I actually don't think that in practice, it's any harder than it is on the standard view because um, the standard view actually has to figure out and how do you manage to go from the pronunciations to these fancy extensions in a way that's common across all speakers of the language, right? Uh, and that, that's like the magical mystery bit of the standard um, view. On the view I'm urging, you say, look, what the kid is, what kids are doing is pairing their lexical items with various concepts. And because they're cooperative speakers who wanna communicate with people around them, they use the rest of their minds to help them figure out um, which concept on a given occasion is being used. And now going back to the question that Susan asked quite rightly, if we can sustain the idealization that the individual concepts have something at least approximating extensions, then for particular thoughts expressed on a particular occasion by a particular speaker, it's no harder to explain how that thought is true or false than it would have been to explain how the sentence was allegedly true or false. An empirical question is to what degree do we converge on the same thoughts? So the standard view just takes it as given. Here we are communicating. And in one loosey-goosey sense of communicating, we are, of course. We're not talking past each other in the way that a monolingual speaker of Japanese and a monolingual speaker of English would be talking past each other. But I don't know the degree to which we're actually communicating if that means latching onto thoughts to have the same truth conditions. My experience engaging with other human beings is that this is actually a rather harder and more difficult enterprise than people suggest to actually get a coherent, clear thought on the blackboard and have everybody agree on truth conditions. And you know, this happens once in a while in science. If you believe that it's just part of human nature, that people just acquire languages and that therefore, as long as the environments are the same, they're sharing truth conditions with each other, then it's true. That's a fact that has to be explained. But I've never seen any evidence that that's a fact that has to be explained as opposed to an aspiration coming from people thinking, isn't it like it more or less is in math and physics all the time? And I have to say, my human experience is the answer is no. Okay, we'll go out of order again to ask Susan's question because I think she has to be somewhere else shortly. Oh, we have to unmute you, Susan. I was interested in the very last part of your talk about the part where, where you're going from the mind the other way in the inter interface. And there's a long tradition in the object substance work showing that direction, right? So the question is when I point to something on a table and say, this is my blicket, Right, um, I could be referring to the stuff, or I I could be referring referring to the objects or, or the individual individuatable units, um, and uh, it, it's it's the part where you say if we did our work right, all right. So the question is that people have taken on the question of what what are the features of the entities there that drive the one construal or the other. It's easy to, to, to do it the other way around. If you, if you disambiguate saying, those are my blickets, yeah. um, 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 then you know, this is easy. But, but the doing my, doing my work right for the, I mean, the point is that literature already shows, I believe the point you wanna make in that mind. And I, I just, I wonder if you know Sandeep Prasada's work about- um... Yeah, I'm working with him on something right now. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, no, sure. so for, for sure. So I really did not do justice in the talk to all of the precursors, neither like here, 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 or here, or even yeah. like my own relevant work that gets at yeah. exactly this question. So for me, what I've focused on when I'm kind of wearing a mini cognitive psychological hat is I've been thinking about the event process distinction, which I take mm -hmm. to be parallel to the object substance right. distinction. And then it, when I'm wearing my semantics hat, I'm trying to think about how the formal theories that have, um, that have been developed, which swoop across and, and invite that analogy, um, how that relates to these features of conceptualization. So absolutely, I need, so <laughs> what I could have included as well was like, collaboration. I don't actually, I'm not a cognitive psychologist. And so I know this literature to which you refer, um, 
Uh, and I know, uh, so in versions of the talk where I'm actually emphasizing my own work on the event process distinction and conceptualization, I would get into, okay, well, what is an object? Right, and that's where all this stuff comes in, like with Sandeep's work and so on. It's like, okay, it's you know this sort of Aristotelian kind of thing, and um, it's about the shaping. So Susan, um, Sue Hespos's and Lance Rips's um, kind of formalization of the principles, which, by the way, are heavily related to the principles that were laid out in um, in the mass count literature. So describing yeah. the semantics of, of these expressions. So I would get into all that and then I would show, okay, if we port those over to event process, it's like, well, when we talk about their shaping, what is it? It was temporal shaping now and kind of emphasizing those things. So, so yeah, so I'm absolutely aware of that literature. I think it's awesome and super inspiring, um, but I didn't do a good job of, of no, bringing in a lot of that stuff here. No, it wasn't a challenge of you're not ref referring to it. I just wanted to check that it actually it is an example of the same oh, totally. question and the same uh, the, the same frame, you know, consi very consistent with what you were. Yeah, ab ab so, so absolutely. Like, I think, I mean, this is it's it's precisely a domain where it seems like like with object substance and then this extension that I'm trying to do with event yeah. process, I think is given the um the intellectual history and the empirical body of work that's been built up on the cog psych side like what's been missing i think is engagement from ling and formal semantics to kind of flesh out this picture so when i drew myself as like in that little spot that's what i'm really really trying to do is like bring it in from that side to connect up with it because then i think we'd have a really nice like working little model uh, uh like really explicit and like formal model of how this thing works but like it needs all the pieces so i think a lot of people have been working out object substance on the cog psych side and of course interfacing like dave barner for sure interfaces a lot with the ling aspects of like the really like heavy formal syntax and semantics and so on but generally speaking those connections are sort of few and far between and i would say linking to paul's talk very likely because a lot of linguists and philosophers, the relevant ones at the end who would be at the interface, sort of are like, I don't need to do any psychology. Like, right, I'm on I'm on strong footing <laughs> to like just ignore all that stuff. So I think there just hasn't been as much buy into the project from the side. So once we do that, then we we have this like really interesting kind of case from which we can build. And I think that's super exciting to see more people. So anybody out there, you know. Anyway, thanks. <laughs> Since I, have, since, since, since I have the microphone, let me just thank again the organizers of this conference. Everybody has done it, but really, it was just so exciting from beginning to end. Thank you. Totally guys. agreed. Thank you, Susan. On that note, I have to say that our uh, live science sessions are over, but we're spilling over right now into our so-called gala session. Um, so please navigate to the coffee break channel in Slack and we can continue the conversation there. We can even have more science going on there. Um, uh, but I also want to say that the conference doesn't end here. We have a few more events that are still coming down the pipeline, a few more office hours with some of our speakers. So please check those out and sign up if you're interested. And then all of the conference materials will be up until the end of next weekend. Uh, so feel free to uh, tie up any loose ends you had and check everything out, um, make all the connections you need to make, because by two Mondays from now, so by the start of June, the Slack will be deactivated. So thank you, everybody. Yes, and so let, let me also thank you for all the speakers, right? So I mean, it, 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 it was an absolutely amazing event. I mean, I don't remember when I was the last conference when I actually attended and wanted to attend it and enjoyed all the talks as, as much as this. Probably it was a, big, a previous Dukok, I guess. Uh, but this, but this, this, this was amazing. And this is also due to, to, uh, to our organization team. So all the people who are organizers up next to their names, they are all students. Some of them actually finished their, their PhD and defended their thesis a uh, day before the conference. But otherwise, all of them are students of of cognitive science, some of them you know, even presented here, but they 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 ran this. They are they were behind Slack, uh, setting up everything and Zoom and everything went smoothly. That's due to them. This is Christy, Gina, uh, Laura, Paula. I, I will forget for some people, uh, Balint uh, and 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 all, all the other people. And finally, I think the the the, the biggest thank you should go to. Rachel and uh, Isabel for setting up this amazing program. 
and those who are rich uh, for for guiding through these four days with, with such with such a grace uh, that, that this was an amazing experience so uh, uh, enjoy the rest of the evening here uh, a day with a day of wherever you are and and you can come over to the other room and uh, just have a chat with us if you want thank you see you there in a few minutes